please go ahead we are live thank you satnam uh, dr anamika can i um, notify you that we are going to be starting shortly okay perfect all right um so welcome everybody to the first day of the international symposium on crime studies i would like to welcome our speakers for this evening uh, dr anamika twaiman ghoshal and dr goswami who's uh, here already um, and i would like to also uh, thank you all for joining us on what is the middle of a work week in the evening and uh, being part of this event to talk uh, some of you are familiar with jindal institute of behavioral science and uh, jindal university but you may not know much about the center for criminology and forensic studies it was founded this year early this year in january with the hopes of doing more focused research in the pedagogy uh, towards forensic science and criminology as applied in legal education and practice uh, we are specifically focused on the interdisciplinarity of these sciences of course jibs is a psychology uh, centered uh, institute so we combine that the study of criminology the various disciplines under criminology and forensic science and law and um, at jgu this is a perfect blend of the expertise that we have gathered and the center aims at doing uh, research into contemporary uh, gaps of practice and policy to supplement not just the indian scholarship and uh, investigative practice but also to work towards uh, better movements in in policing in legislation in investigation and policy making um in the whole of south asia that's our aim and through this year despite the events that we have all we are all familiar with since march uh we it has been a setback but we have been hosting a lot of events uh since then but this is our first international event uh we have uh for our speakers and for the rest of our audience i would like to let you know we have around 900 participants almost 172 of whom have already joined us today here uh, we're expecting some more and they all come from about 25 countries from usa indonesia bangladesh pakistan uk um and, and the eastern european countries as well so Thank you so much for to everyone for joining us here and before I begin uh the the speeches for today for this um event I would also like to inform you some of you may have already uh, seen our first flyer that went out and may be aware that Dr Ashwini Kumar a former CBI director and a uh, governor of uh, Manipur and Nagaland was supposed to be part of today's event uh, dr kumar was uh, a, a good ally to the institute as well as the university he was an advisor on uh, several centers including our center unfortunately we lost him earlier this month on the 7th of october person he was he, his loss will be felt very deeply um i would like to ob observe uh, a few seconds in the silence um but before that we also have with us dr goswami and his peer and colleague who has known him and worked with him for much longer than i have known him so dr goswami can i request you to please uh, share a few words in memory of dr kumar dr goswami can you hear me yeah thank you miss follow me uh, to give me this opportunity indeed it is a very great loss late dr aswani kumar sir was not only a legendary police officer 
and accomplished with academic vision he was having very great administrative foresight and above all he was a great human being so i joined cbi after his retirement from the post of director cbi but his footprints and initiatives were writ large all over the working of the bureau the news of his untimely demise came as great shock to all of us since his last email to me for this webinar and as you know that he was a co panelist in this session with uh, where i will also speak his email was so vibrant and encouraging that it never even hinted to his mental state as being depressed or disheartened with his life with this i pay my sincere heartfelt homage to his departed soul may he rest in peace thank you thank you dr goswami i remember that uh, email um he had just called me up and wanted to be connected with you so that um, we could discuss the panel um it is a very sorry loss for all of us and uh, may i request that we observe uh, 10 seconds of silence in memory of um, the great soul that was dr ashwin kumar thank you everybody um thank you for your words dr goswami a uh, moving on to what today's event is brings for us may i now introduce uh, our keynote speaker for the day uh, dr anamika twaimin ghoshal uh dr anamika holds a phd in criminology and justice policy from northeastern university she also has a business law degree from qnul and a bachelor's from the university of wolverton she's currently working at stonehill university where Sorry about that we are experiencing a bit of an issue with the internet on my end. Uh, it's been going on for a few days so I'm very sorry. I'll take very little time then and hand it over to Dr. Anamika. Um one of the key things that I want to mention is that uh, most of you will have read her profile on the uh flyer that we have circulated but it is very amazing her her key area of research that I was interested in was maritime piracy and state crimes. and then speaking to her more we learned that that has somehow led her to work in green criminology and environmental harm uh, including the indigenous populations so she's a widely published uh, author she's got her authorships in the british journal of criminology uh, in the uh, commercial crime international and several other uh, renowned uh, journals and she has also uh, appeared as an author a lot of books and appeared in uh, several other edited versions so um she she will i think right now she's the best person to talk about her research and her work and uh, time permitting hopefully someone will ask a question 
about her maritime piracy. This is my hint to you. She's got a database uh, on, mar on contemporary maritime piracy uh, available um, from 1991, her work from 1991 to 2018. So we look forward to hearing more about that. And over to you, Dr. Anamika. Hello, what a lovely introduction, thank you. <laughs> um, so good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I wish we were able to do this in person, but instead I'm zooming in from Boston in the United States. It is, uh, what are we now, 6.40 a.m. here, and it is still dark. Um, so the benefit of being digital is that I see that there are people from over two, from 25 countries and I've seen in the chat people saying hello and telling uh, where, they're, where they're zooming in from. So that's very exciting. And so although I'm sitting in my study in Boston, I'm able to connect with uh, so many people from around the world, which is very exciting to me. So I'm gonna take a moment and I'm going to um, start by sharing my screen. Uh, so just give me one second while I set that up. Um, okay, so hopefully you can see my screen now. So um, I wanted to first start off by saying I'm so very grateful for Dr. Sani, Dr. Badra, and the Center for Criminology and Forensic Studies at Jindal Institute of Behavioral Sciences for organizing the first international symposium on crime studies. I think especially during these turbulent times that we're experiencing, it is important for us to continue to come together and have important conversations such as these uh, on how we can best serve society as social scientists. I'm very humbled to have been invited to deliver the keynote speech at this inaugural event. I'm excited to be part of this symposium, not only because it provides a platform for conversations on transnational crime studies, something that has been central to my scholarship, um, but also because of the ambit of these conversations are non-traditional, pushing the boundaries of legal and criminological scholarship. So with this in mind, I wanna start uh, where I begin when I am teaching a class on global crime. Uh, my global crime class is a class in which I discuss transnational and international um, crimes uh, and uh, in the context of globalization. So I tell my, uh, my students, hmm, let me try to work out where my, uh, there we go. Um, I tell my students, uh, uh, about myself and about my mixed roots. I tell them that my uh, name is Anamika Agnieszka Twyman Gershel. I will admit it is a very challenging name for most. I tell them that my father was from India, that my mother was from Poland, that I was born in Germany, that I grew up in Austria, that I studied and lived in the United Kingdom, that my husband is English, that I have now lived in the United States for the past 17 years. I do this because I wanna place my work, my research, my teaching and me in context. I tell my students that I am what sociologists call an adult third culture kid, which means I was raised in a culture other than that of my parents and have lived in different environments for a significant part of my childhood and my adulthood. I'm quite simply a product of globalization. My Bengali father met my mother while completing his mechanical engineering degree in Poland. And together they found a wanderlust which took me from Germany to Poland, to India and to Austria. As a result, I'm transnational in my identity. I do not belong to any one place. And because of this, I see the world differently. This means I approach social reality from a different vantage point something that I have relied on more and more as in my work as I've grown older and more confident. Therefore, what I'm here to talk to you about today is the use of a critical criminology lens. During these turbulent times of social, economic, political, and environmental upheaval, I believe that academia has much to offer and needs to step up. This is particularly true for the study of crime and its control. Thinking of a famous quote by Nelson Mandela, it bears remembering, 
No one truly knows a nation until one has been inside its jails. A no nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones. In our globalized world, we have the opportunity and a duty to make the world a better place. And that sounds like something that people just say, but it has to be a better place for those who have historically been disadvantaged, a better place for future generations. However, according to a recent issue of The Economist, there is currently a global crisis in human rights, where democracy and human rights are in retreat around the world. A global pandemic, the looming catastrophic climate crisis and social unrest across many countries are challenging us to think about our assumptions of what is good and what is bad and present us with an opportunity to transform society. In this environment of change and upheaval, we have the opportunity to, as a, to help society adapt, to change and to rethink its identity. To do this, we have to begin by examining how we define crime and scrutinize the label of criminal. As scholars of crime, we need to ask ourselves if using the law as a guide for what is, is adequate for what we should study. Is a legalistic definition an appropriate standard? To use the words of the journalist Jose Antonio Vargas, colonialism was legal, slavery was legal, the Holocaust was legal, Jim Crow was legal, apartheid was legal. Therefore, legality is a matter of power, not justice. And to me, criminology is not the study of crime, but the study of justice. The American historian Howard Zinn explained the distinction between law and justice is ignored by all those politicians who solemnly invoke as their highest concern, the rule of law. And we've heard the rule of law a lot. Zinn explains, the law can be just, it can be unjust. It does not deserve to inherit the ultimate authority of the divine right of the king. Moreover, the law is time and place specific. What is defined as a crime in India today may not have so been defined in the past or in another country. The law and its definition of crime is relative to geography and generation. In the rules of sociological method, the French sociologist Emile Durkheim explained, we do not condemn it because it is a crime, but it is a crime because we condemn it. And so crime has a functional utility. It serves society, a purpose in society. As scholars, we need to acknowledge that crime is a social construct, that it serves a social purpose to define certain acts as criminal whilst immunizing others from its reach. If we then use such a defective and limited construct to drive our intel intellectual endeavors, our entire discipline becomes flawed. Therefore, since the law is ar largely artificial and should not tell us what to study, how do we delineate our craft? Several theorists, theorists have attempted to address this issue, some more successfully than others. Thorsten Selen in 1938 talked about using conduct norms to define crime. However, those two are arbitrary and remain time and place specific. Others have suggested scholars can make personal judgments on what crime is. For instance, Godfreyson and Hershey in 1990 talk about crimes and analogous acts, and have included smoking, gambling, and adultery in their definition of crime. Edwin Sutherland, in his bold effort in the mid 1900s to include white collar crime into our discipline, suggested both criminal and regulatory laws as a guide for the definition of crime. However, all these attempts leave us short. Perhaps the most useful efforts to rethinking our discipline comes from the, uh, those that have thought critically through uh, about the essence of crime and focused on the injury caused. Critical criminologists such as Schwendinger and Schwendinger have approached the problem using what they call a humanistic definition, 
of crime, one that looks at violations of human rights and the resulting willful social harm. Critical criminologists such as Don Roth, David Kauzarich, Michalowski and Kramer, David Friedrichs and Greg Barak have all studied crime using such a lens. This is an approach that has tackled complicated social issues, what Pierce has called the crimes of the powerful. This umbrella term has included the study of corporate crime, state crime, state corporate crime, and crimes of globalization and systemic injustices. Without such an approach, our discipline is guilty of what David Friedrichs has called an inverted criminology, where behaviors that have the most harmful social impact receive the least attention. It is this human rights social harm approach that I advocate for here. So what is critical criminology? Critical criminology calls for a commitment to broaden the scope of criminological analysis and integrating the interaction of inequality and crime into our work. The pictures in this slide come from various countries around the world, across the global south and the global north, from India, Mexico, Kenya, and Tanzania to the United States and the United Kingdom. They laid bare the extreme wealth gap that has been ushered in by neoliberal globalization. So critical criminology asks us to interrogate power. The term critical criminology is relatively new, dating back to the 1970s. However, the idea is much older. For instance, the Italian philosopher Cesare Beccaria, considered one of the most influential Western jurists, was concerned with political oppression in European aristocrat, uh, by European aristocrats when he published his 1764 work on crimes and punishment. He advocated at a time uh, that he, at the time that he was writing, he, was, he um, advocated for radical criminal justice reform. Today, his work is considered orthodox, but at the time he wanted to ensure that governments would only use their power to protect people from each other and what he believed was their Hobbesian self-interested human natures. His treatise is fundamentally about limiting the abuse of power by government. Another influential thinker, the American sociologist and historian Du Bois, also used a critical lens in, uh, with which to analyze crime in the United States a country which has been plagued with a history of oppression and white supremacy. He identified that the social system is skewed in favor, in favor of the rich. He wrote, in convictions by human courts, the rich always are favored at the expense of the unfortunate class and whites at the expense of blacks. He had recognized that public opinion sways what we consider crime and that punishments are tailored not to the crimes, but who had committed the act. Du Bois explained that crime is a phenomenon that stands not alone, but rather as a symptom of countless wrong social conditions. So today, perhaps more than ever, we are aware of these countless wrong social conditions. And as criminologists, we need to ensure we center these in our work. We have a duty to dig deep and lay bare the complexity of the subject of crime. We need to integrate the reality that inequality and crime are inextricably linked. And we need to ensure that we do not perpetuate a system of inequality, but recomm recommit ourselves as scholars to pursue justice. So how to use such a critical criminological lens. I'm not advocating that all legal and criminological scholarship focus on crimes of the powerful. A critical criminology approach means representing the side of the economically and socially marginalized. Let me repeat that, representing the side of the economically and socially marginalized. It is about equity, social inclusion, and human rights. It's about understanding contexts. A critical criminology approach exposes injustices, examines the processes and practices of lawmaking, lawbreaking, and societal reaction. 
this lens can become an integral component of our research, our teaching, our learning, and the way we live our lives. In research, this lens requires a high degree of self-awareness, self-criticism, and self-examination, which enables scholars to recognize biases, identify inequality and domination, and how these shape the questions that are asked and the methods being used to investigate the answers. Jock Young, in his book, The Criminological Imagination, explained that reality has, lost, has been lost in a sea of statistical symbols and dubious analyses. And so it is important to not only interrogate the questions we are asking, but to identify the most appropriate methods to answer the questions posited, to resist the temptation of chasing prestige and rampant positivism. Remember that we are a social science. Humans, human behavior, and human societies are complex and do not lend themselves to simple quantification. The tools of research should not limit the reality we're trying to capture. Both quantitative and qualitative methods are valuable. Your research question should guide you to the most appropriate ways to finding the answers. I think perhaps some examples may be useful here. My academic life began with research on maritime piracy. The media was awash with reports about Somali piracy, but I wanted to know if Somali piracy was indeed an issue of our time. What did Somali piracy look like? How did it compare to other piracies around the world? At the time that I began my research, there was no single integrated data source of maritime piracy. Researchers had used the International Maritime Bureau Piracy Reporting Center's piracy reports to derive some basic numbers on attacks per country, but with very little detail on the nature of these attacks. Having worked for the International Maritime Bureau in London in the past, I had some prior knowledge and access to a wealth of data, not just their reports, but also their staff who had decades of experience. With this, I began to build a database of global maritime piracy attacks. I took the IMB's piracy reports and I combined them with the worldwide threats to shipping summaries collected by the United States National Geospatial Worldwide Threats to Shipping Summaries. The NGIA collects information from various coast guards and media sources around the world. My aim was to create a comprehensive catalog of piracy cases. I coded each incident manually and it took me a while close to two years of sitting in front of my screen, filling information on ship cargo, vessel types, number of assailants, who, what was stolen, how the vessel had dealt with the attack and so on. I coded two waves from 1991 to 2000 and then from 2001 to 2010. The first wave from 2011 to 2018 was coded just recently, but this time by a dedicated team of student researchers. Today, the Contemporary Maritime Piracy Database has over 10,000 cases coded, capturing incidents of global maritime piracy from 1991 to 2018. The data distinguishes between different types of acts that can fall within the various definitions of piracy. The database includes 50 distinct variables ranging from information about date, time and location of the attack, the vessel victimized, the responsible party, the types of casualties and losses, and attack details and weapons used. I'm currently working to make this data set available publicly through an online application. These are some screenshots of the data set that will be available for use by researchers, hopefully by the end of this year. I used the second wave, 2001 to 2010, a decade that really put piracy in the media spotlight to identify where piracy happens. I was able to classify um, the five highest piracy incident countries, the HPICs, to better understand what piracy looks like. In that decade, the CMPD showed not only changes in the location of piracy by continent, continent, as you see here, but also by country. 
And you can see the two major countries that popped out were Somalia and Indonesia. What is important is that the data told me that the nature of piracy was different depending on location. Piracy is not a single type of act. It presents in various forms. The CMPD identified that Somali piracy occurs mainly in the high seas, targets vessels in motion during the daytime. The attackers from Somalia are most likely to be armed and threatening, but do not usually assault their victims. Conversely, Somali attacks were less likely to uh, uh, successfully board potential targets, but when they were successful, the ship would be held for ransom uh, rather than targeting cargo or crew belongings. The second wave also identified other interesting facts. For instance, looking at the level of armament across the HPICs, it is clear that piracy off the coast of Somalia is highly armed, whilst most piracy from India only exhibited very basic arms or was unarmed. When looking at the level of violence used in attack, India is consistent with the results on the level of armament. Most attacks are simple thefts and have little or no interpersonal violence. But contrary to media representation, Somali attacks were not the most violent form of piracy. Although the top three HPICs, that is Somalia, Indonesia, and Nigeria, all had threatening forms of piracy, Nigerian piracy victims reported more physical assaults than other locations. The CMPD demonstrates the importance of monitoring the changing nature and trends of contemporary piracy. Throughout history, we have seen that piracy morphs in nature and location. Without a consistent empirical data collection effort and analysis infrastructure, the subtle changes of piracy tactics, nature and trends remain a best guess. Building the CMPD taught me to ask better questions and the importance of working diligently to answer questions as accurately as possible. I learned about the importance of language we use to describe phenomena, about the definitions and the assumptions that guide our research. I learned to be skeptical about the assumptions we make about deterrence as a method to reduce the incidence of piracy. The data set solicited a whole host of new questions. The 2001 to 2010 analysis stimulated questions about Somali piracy. Why did piracy start in a country that had no history of such acts? Why was piracy from Somalia so different? These questions could not be answered with the CMPD. It required a qualitative approach we did not, which did not have the constraints of quantitative research, where I would be able to, uh, to use exploratory research questions to understand social context and the meanings that events had for local populations. I used a chronologically ordered case study with a historical policy analysis to investigate what had happened in Somalia. It is a long, complicated story, as you can imagine. But to summarize it briefly here, the study found that piracy began in Somalia as a self-protection mechanism, which was seen as necessary due to the absence of a government control mechanism to guard against foreign exploitation. Local fishermen who had been relocated 20 years earlier to start a fishing industry by the Bar regime saw that foreign exploitation as a threat to livelihood of local communities. The first recorded Somali piracy attack occurred the same month that Siad Bar, the president of Somalia, was ousted. Foreign exploitation including tox included toxic waste dumping and illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, something that was ignored by the international community and rarely reported by the international media. From this initial impetus, piracy developed into a form of taxation where vessels would be captured and a ransom demanded, making it unlike most other piracies around the world. The ransom was seen as a tax levied on the international community for damage done. A tax did not differentiate between ships. Any merchant vessel close to the coast was seen as complicit in the harm being done. The business model that evolved continued to use the same modus operandi and rationalizations even 
when the exploitation ceased. This case study was fundamental in teaching me about using a critical lens. The wealth of information that I gleaned from the research taught me about the complexity of the subject of crime and the importance of understanding context. As a junior criminologist, I had underestimated how important it was to understand international politics, economics, and history to fully grasp what had happened in Somalia. I had to learn about globalization, neoliberalization, inequality, power, and oppression to better understand how and why Somalia became a piracy hotspot. I learned to think about piracy differently, to incorporate the perspective of those that were economically and socially marginalized. These lessons have stayed with me and have guided me ever since. And I have applied this broader focus to all my work. I have used these experiences to study, to, to study state crime, terrorism, and now more recently, climate change. I wanna share with you my research on state crime, which has focused on a little known case of the Chagos Archipelago, now known as the British Indian Ocean Territory. Chagos is an archipelago of about 2,300 small islands in the Indian Ocean, about 1,000 miles Southwest of India. The main island is Diego Garcia. Today, Diego Garcia houses one of the largest US military bases that is critical to the American hegemony. I used a qualitative research methodology to delve deeply into the history of the archipelago. I wanted to understand why and how the islands were recolonized by the British in the 1970s and the entire indigenous population forcibly evicted during a time of decolonization and an international commitment to human rights. The case study required immersing myself in legal cases from the United Kingdom, the United States and international courts and in archived government documents. We know that as an international community, we struggle to deal with international crimes such as genocide and crimes against humanity. We are even worse at dealing with extraordinary state crimes, ones that do not fall neatly within the definitions of the Rome Statute. I also learned that nation states such as the United States and the United Kingdom can collude to commit an act which both countries know contravene international law. Just like co-offending between individuals, countries are capable of engaging in state co-offending to circumvent established legal standards that protect human rights. So how does all this commit to the climate, uh, connects to the climate crisis and what can we do? In my work on piracy, environmental concerns were raised as the impetus for the onset of piracy in Somalia. These concerns not only affected the livelihood of fisher folk off the coast of Somalia, but have had a lasting effect on our ecosystems. The international community and sovereign nation states involved in anti-piracy efforts did not consider these issues important and did not include them in counter-piracy strategies. In my work on Ch the Chagos Archipelago, I saw the opposite. Environmental protection was used as a way to shield the offending nation states from their international obligations to repatriate the indigenous populations to the archipelago and from upholding their human rights. So the environment has been treated as a tool of foreign policy rather than crucial for the survival of our human race. And social scientists as criminal and criminologists we need to seek out and highlight injustice. The environment is inextricably linked to a human rights social harm approach. As social scientists, we can explain the dynamics that brought us to the climate crisis. As criminologists, we can go further. We can explore and ascertain the, responsible, the responsibility of the most polluting and damaging industries and countries so as to hold them accountable and make right their wrongs. We need to lay bare how our global economy has maintained decades of what Kramer has called climate crimes. We have the tools to do this. We all need, all we need is the willingness to see this as a central enterprise of what Jock Young called the criminological imagination. 
I want to conclude today by talking again about teaching. As scholars, our work is only partially fulfilled. Our teaching and the learning of our students is a critical component of building a better world. I found the need to use critical criminology, a critical criminology lens through the journey of my research. As a junior scholar, I was lucky to have a mentor who stimulated me to ask non-traditional questions and read non-traditional texts. I wanna pass this on to all scholars of law and crime, not only to encourage critical thinkers who deconstruct, deconstruct established knowledge, but to create a discipline that meaningfully engages in building a just world. I'm actively seeking to be an anti-racist and decolonizing educator, but the scale of the work requires all of us to participate. The colonial mindset is deeply embedded in our psyche and we need to actively pursue the alternative. Criminology, as many other disciplines, follows a largely white curriculum. We need to ensure that the thinkers from other parts of the world are integrated meaningfully to help us build a representative scholarship. To do this, we need to ask better questions, deconstruct the narrative, and challenge this existing status quo. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope I've provided you with some food for thought and challenge you to take on the mandate to actively use a critical criminological lens. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nanaka. This was very interesting uh, to hear. Specifically, now I have a lot of questions for you, um, specifically about you building the database from scratch, because um, you did talk a lot about uh, it was a you did it by hand by yourself and maybe later on you got some assistance from uh, research graduate students. Uh, but that is a key problem uh, or a key issue in India as well. Uh, when if you are working in an area where um, research data or literature is not available and you have to build towards the database, uh, there are challenges. Of course, uh, it's a different system. Um, uh, fortunately, you had uh, the British Maritime Agency to, um, to provide or assist with a lot of structured data. Um, but could you let us know what are the challenges that you faced? Um, and I know you spoke about it already, but if, if you were to advise us on uh, what's the best way to go around building something from scratch, what would you um, consider? Well, I think obviously the biggest challenge always begins with access to data and to ensuring that the data that you are accessing is, um, is reliable. Um, so I think that's probably the first part of it. And um, I was lucky to have access to the International Maritime Bureau, but I felt that even their data did not really capture the entire picture of what was happening globally. Um, so I did some research, a lot of research, and I found that the uh, NGIA, the, uh, um, the Geospatial Intelligence Agency here in the United States, um, was really um, able to add to the information that we had from the International Maritime Bureau. The NGIA collects information from Coast Guards around the world and, from, um, and also um, gets the information from media services. Um, so it has, I think, approximately 30 different sources um, for their information. Um, so I actually pulled all of that data and all of this data comes in the form of, um, I would call them little blurbs. So little descriptions of what happened. And so it really required pulling apart those descriptions and finding some common threads. So something that I could find in all the different, um, in all the different uh, uh, data uh, sources and uh, code that. And so really I was trying to code that information and trying to be as true as possible to the depth and wealth of information that I had. Um, so I remember adding more and more um, variables to try and capture it. And again, you will have that issue between um, 
uh, that data is not available across every case. So you will have a lot of missing data. And so again, being as honest and transparent about what your data can and can't do. Um, since um, I began building the CMPD, there are now other databases on maritime piracy. A lot of these databases um, try and uh, connect the maritime piracy data to other databases, um, such as political instability databases and so on. Um, I prefer to focus just on the piracy data. The reason that I find that that's important is because I feel that researchers can themselves independently then decide, depending on what their research question is, how to connect that to other data that helps them answer the questions they're looking for. So instead of focusing on connecting, connecting it to other databases, what I found important is trying to get as much, inf much information out of the data sources that I had and try and provide a really um, broad understanding of piracy. Um, so I guess my main point in terms of ans answering your question is to try and be as honest and transparent. If your data does not answer some questions or you had to make some assumptions, record that. Uh, keep, a, keep a journal of everything, every decision you're making and why you're making that decision and make that available to other researchers. And that's one of the reasons that I am trying to work on creating this CMPD as an as a, as a open source data set so that other researchers can take it and do something with it that can answer a variety of questions. I looked at Somalia, but that data set presents so, many, so much wealth of data that so many other countries could be analyzed. So many other questions could be asked. That, that was very informative. And um, I, I wonder if you can see uh, Metra online. Uh, she's the next uh, speaker. And um, I know that uh, she also is researching on South Asian archives. And so that's a question for you also, Metra, that we will come to for you, because it's, it's very difficult. And as I understand, you know, to, uh, to do these kind of studies when the databases or data is not accessible. So um, you also spoke about uh, decolonizing your education. And that is something that we have also been, or I have also been trying to do um, here because you are right, like most of the criminology text are the way we look at criminology studies uh, from methodology to interpretation uh, is very white, very American, um, and, and we are trying to build different narratives. So when you are trying to um, attempt at decolonizing the pedagogy, I know you shared that paper with me. So could, would you share some um, brief takeaways on how to go about for especially uh, for we have postgraduate students attending, so they will at some time in future probably be traveling abroad when things are better for the higher education, uh, probably doing their postdoc studies. So this is something that they could, uh, an advice that they could actively incorporate in their um, thesis going forward. Absolutely. I mean, I think the uh, the idea of decolonization is something that I have become increasingly, I guess, close to obsessed with. Um, like you just said, our um, particularly criminology is very focused on American criminology um, and European scholars kind of, uh, if you look a little bit further back in terms of sociological influences. Um, the problem is we really are not incorporating Asian, African perspectives. We really have not had a meaningful conversation about what contributions have already been made by thinkers and scholars in, in the other continents. Um, and so it's something that I believe we really need to change. And I think it is something that is beyond one individual, but if we all engage in this practice of looking at uh, the scholarship that exists, for example, in India with, um, um, I also looked at um, some of the works uh, of various scholars in Africa to identify how, for example, restorative justice has been part of the very fabric of the way communities have dealt with crimes. Um, 
a lot of us kind of come to restorative justice as something different, as something alternative. But really, if you look back in history, restorative justice is something that has been integral to the way we've dealt with crime in the past. And so I feel like we've missed this huge history um, and begun and begun uh, teaching cr criminology and understanding criminology from a very truncated approach. Um, so uh, I will admit that for me, this is a, this, this is a, a journey. I certainly feel that I'm at the beginning of this journey and that there's, a, there's much work to be done, but I feel particularly as we look at, um, uh, and as criminology becomes um, more common across uh, the globe in terms of as a discipline that is being taken seriously, as a discipline that is integrated into higher education, uh, this white criminology will not do. It, it, it is not sufficient. Um, and so I, as, as having worked in the United States for the past 17 years, um, uh, certainly one of the key components of that has been in this country just to include uh, anti-racism and black voices, um, black voices that have been excluded. I mentioned Du Bois as one of uh, one of uh, critical scholars who have had a major impact of criminology. However, if you look at criminology texts, traditional criminology texts, very few, if any, mention Du Bois. Um, so we have so much work to do. And I just hope that particularly at the graduate students that you are mentioning will take on this mandate, look through the scholarship uh, in their countries to see what is there that already exists, that has been missed, that has been omitted. Because as we omit those voices, we are omitting a chance for us to make the world a better place. And I know I keep saying make the world a better place. It sounds like one of those things that you hear, you know, um, uh, tossed around all the time. But as academics, I really feel that's the reason we started what, we, what we're doing because we really want to make a difference. And so uh, I certainly hope your graduate students, all graduate students take on the mandate. Thank you for that answer. Um, I know we spoke, I mean, there's a lot to be got, talked about, about decolonization. And of course, uh, there's a lot about that we can do, at least uh, speaking from the Indian academic uh, point of view, uh, where we also need to uh, up our game with regards to dissemination, not just publication, because I think all academics publish, but it's about dissemination and about meeting, um, I wouldn't say, Western standards, but um, just global standards of what scholarship, sh good scholarships should look like, and which is where methodology uh, comes in um, very prominently. I'm now going to present some questions from um, the audience that we have gathered. Uh, one of the prime, at least three people have uh, asked this question in some form of the other, so I'm just going to pull their questions and, and ask you um, a, a, a collated version. It's from Anushri uh, Krishna Bodhan from Nepal and Jyoti from India. In most cases, they are uh, talking about and um, about when the victims of crime are someone and the equation of power. When your perpetrator is a powerful person dictating the very uh, way the investigation and um, legislation, judiciary is going to move. And I guess the indication is when you're talking about power, you're talking about state power. When they are at fault, and um, despite the laws, and despite, and that has been a trend, more so seen in 2020, um, with even despite the laws and legal provisions, uh, victims have not been able to get justice. I think what they're asking you is a very broad-ended uh, question about how can the victims get justice, but we know this problem is much deeper. So would you uh, rather just drop in a few comments on the situation from your studies? Yeah, I think the question is really, um, the best way to deal with that question, it's a, it's a great question and I wish I had a good answer for you, but the reality is that there's a difference between 
academia and practitioners, right? So when we're talking about how do we get justice for those who have been victimized by those who are in power, this is something that is common. I go back to uh, what um, Friedrich called an inverted criminology. We have a lot of concern in criminology about those who are, who have perpetrated crimes who are the powerless. Uh, much of criminology is focused on that. Um, and, and what I'm advocating for here is let's redress that balance. It does not mean that we forget about crimes of the powerless, but it is important for us to make sure that we also talk about crimes of the powerful and that we make that a central part of our discipline. If we make that a central part of our discipline, then hopefully that trickles down, that that has a knock-on effect, that when we talk about practitioners and we uh, ensure that the laws are more just, that we ensure that um, governments are held accountable, that practices are transparent. Um, but as academics, our power lies in our voices and in our analysis and in our research. Um, unfortunately, as academics, we usually don't have a direct impact in terms of we can help an individual who's been victimized by someone in power. But our research is what should ultimately affect our um, the, the policies. And so if we're talking about affecting policies, if we as academics cannot envision a better world, if we cannot envision um, the reality of uh, crimes of those who are in power to be uh, part of our, of our scrutiny, then they cannot end up happening in terms of policy either. Our laws will not reflect that unless we imagine it first. So in this, so this is where I say that we as, as academics, as social scientists need to step up to the plate. The more we show that that is a critical part of our discipline, that it is critical to social science that we engage in these conversations, then there can be this next step of policies reflecting the reality of what crime really is. Thank you. Uh, that was, uh, I mean, we are not still over the phenomena and it is true that as academics, we have very limited um, power over how we can exert. Apart from just influencing policy with our research, I believe our teaching, our classroom teaching is very important in the mindset that we set amongst the generation coming. Because if we are looking to fix the, uh, the disparity between powers between different groups, um, the next generation is the hope. And that's something that we take forward. We have uh, another question regarding your research in, uh, from Kevin Justin. In the Somalia case, you talked about uh, the, the, that you spoke about. Do you think that the government or a high ranking group was behind the piracy? Um, because the government caved in to the pressure coming from different countries, is it most likely to capture this pirate rather than, um, you know, was it was was the apprehension um, uh, uh, government supported? I think that's what Kevin is asking. Was it was the piracy or the or the crime supported or allowed by the government? And the government only took action uh, when different countries put pressure because then there was an international uh, soft power at play. So that's a good question. Um, the story of Somalia is, is, is a very complicated story. So actually what happened in Somalia was in 1991, Syed Barr was ousted from uh, power. He had been, he had initially actually started uh, with very um, uh, social uh, uh, policies, but then over time, over during his rule, he turned from a president to a dictator. Um, so when by 1991 he had been ousted, what happened to Somalia is that it resulted in a country without a centralized state. Um, some have called Somalia um, a failed state. I'm not particularly keen on the terminology failed state. Again, as a critical criminologist, I feel it's important to be very careful and nuanced about what it is, uh, what, about how we use our language. But um, what is important about the idea that there was no centralized government is that um, as the country be, uh, uh, was left without a central government, 
there was no um, there was no monitoring of the coastline. So I'm going to talk specifically about piracy here. But when the coastlines were mo uh, were not monitored, there was an extremely high level of exploitation by foreign nations of the Somali coastline. Somalia has one of the longest coastlines in Africa, and I think that's an important piece because it is also uh, the the ecosystem of the coast of Somalia is actually very rich. Um, um, so there was the, so it was not only that there was the IUU fishing, so illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, but there was also toxic waste dumping. You can't really talk about government involvement in piracy because there was no centralized government at that point. However, there was um, there were local governments. So if you look at the map of Somalia, you'll actually see that there are different er uh, areas of Somalia. Uh, Somaliland, for instance, which is the most um, uh, uh, northwestern part of Somalia uh, has never had a single piracy case coming out of Somaliland. It had actually arranged itself with a very, um, uh, very secure um, local government. Uh, Puntland, which is where the majority of piracy came from, actually had also had a local government. However, the local government allowed a, a modicum of stability. So we did not have the same thing happening in Puntland as we did in southern Somalia. Southern Somalia is where Mogadishu, the capital, is. That is what you've actually heard a lot more about in the news in terms of warlords and a lot of conflict happening. That was happening in southern Somalia. But in Puntland, it was relatively stable. Stable but still not the, 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 the idea of a stable country, but there wasn't the same sort of level of conflict. And actually what happened with piracy is it thrived in an area where there wasn't complete chaos and conflict like you had in Southern Somalia. Um, and there wasn't the strict government control or local government control that you had in Somaliland. So Puntland ended up being the area where you found the most piracy happening. Piracy requires, as many crimes do, requires actually a working infrastructure. When there is no working infrastructure, it's actually hard for something like piracy, which is highly organized as a crime, to function. I wouldn't say that the um, Puntland local government was influenced, was influencing piracy in terms of they were not directing it, there was There were some very unfortunate decisions being made. And again, this goes back to our very neoliberal system of globalization. Um, the monitoring of the coastline was uh, subcontracted initially to a Canadian firm and then to a British firm. That means that these firms would be able to monitor the fishing licenses off the coast of Somalia. And there was no monitoring from the local government about how these licenses were issued. These licenses were not issued with the support of the local uh, uh, fishing population, the local fishing community. So these licenses were there. These companies made a lot of money. The local community saw none of that. And so again, we can see that it is, it is a matter of an international community approach that was missing. It was, we were so focused on our a, a, a free market system where companies and corporations could offer security, but the security was offered for international fishing fleets, not for the local communities to be able to do what they had, what was their right to do as the local community. Um, so I wouldn't say that there was a government uh, a government um, support for piracy, but certainly the government role in piracy was more of uh, neglect and perhaps a lack of control. But again, if you look at the situation of Puntland at the time, there was no international funding or support for that local government. There was no support for them to set up its own coast, coast Guard. And when that did happen, it, the, the support came from these corporations, from international corporations that were more focused on making money for their corporations. And when, and, and, uh, and when the money dried up, the, the, there was no more security, there was no more Coast Guard, they just left. And so that's the problem about um, hiring or contracting the security for, for, a, for a community. Thank you, that, that, was, um, that was a very comprehensive answer and that- uh, Sorry. <laughs> and, and the local uh, sociology in the crime. Unfortunately, we are running a little bit over time, so um, we are uh, we cannot take the rest of the questions. Uh, but uh, we will uh, stop now. And thank you so much, um, Dr. Namaka, for joining us this early.
uh, for for your for this conversation. Um, we have a lot of uh, feedback about your talk. Everybody found that interesting, and they are waiting to um, have access to your database when that is re ready. So I guess you will there you get a lot more followers uh, going forward. Uh, we will now take a short break. Our next speaker, uh, Dr. Sharafi, is already online, but we just quickly break for two minutes. Um, I understand that some of our um, attendees are having problems with an attendance form, so I'll just quickly on, uh, get online with the IT and figure that out. Uh, so just going offline for a bit, and Dr. Sharafi, let's say we start by 5.08. Yeah, in three, four, five minutes. All right, so thank you so much, and we'll see you in a short while.
everybody for the second uh, talk of this evening. Uh, just before we begin, I would like to clarify that uh, there are some queries about not being able to go forward with the attendance list, which is perhaps because you haven't registered and we don't have you on a database. Um, I've asked someone to drop a Google link at the end of the session. Uh, please fill that in and we will count that towards your attendance for the first and second session as well. This is for the attendees. Uh, moving forward, I would like to welcome uh, our next speaker for today, uh, Dr. Mitra Sharafi. She's a legal historian uh, of South Asia at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, the law school. She trained as a lawyer and historian, and she holds both history degrees from McGill and Princeton, where she did her uh, doctorate studies from, and she has a law degrees from Cambridge and Oxford. Uh, Dr. Sharafi is presently working on her book project called Fear of the Falls, Forensic Science in Colonial India. Um, I don't know how we connected, uh, but we somehow connected over this, the, the fact that she's working on the history of forensic science in, in colonial India, and well, I'm a forensic scientist in India. Um, she's uh, she's vastly published, um, and some of her works include an article on abortion in uh, colonial India, and another on forensic bloodstain analysis and uh, the imperial serologist in British India. Uh, I would suggest that you go on Google Scholar and read some of her works. I've happened to read some, and they're very interesting if you are interested in the history of forensics. Uh, she already also has a book called The Law and Identity in Colonial South Asia, Farsi Legal Culture, 1772 to 1947, published by the Cambridge University Press, uh, which is also something that you might uh, want to go have a read at. And today she is here to talk about interdisciplinarity in studies. When we think of forensics, we generally think mostly about the science part of it. Uh, but here we have Dr. Sharafi telling us why the history matters in the study of the science. So over to you now, Dr. Sharafi. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and thank you to the Jindal Center for Criminology and Forensic Studies and to Palomi Badra for so much work that she's put into making this event possible. Uh, I'm really pleased and honored to be with you today. So today I want to historicize several fields of forensic analysis, and I'll be drawing upon the research I'm doing for my book, which, um, as just mentioned, is about um, falsity and forensic science in colonial India. And I also teach an undergraduate course at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the US, which is a history of forensic science course, and I look at the English-speaking world from the 19th century onwards. So I'm drawing on all of this in my talk today. Now you may think of forensic science as an objective, neutral, universal field of knowledge and techniques, but it too has a history. And what you see today in forensic science may owe much to the past. My focus today is gonna to be on how forensic sciences have built or struggled to build credibility and authority for themselves historically. And I'll be drawing on examples from uh, British India, colonial India, the larger British empire. And now and then I'll also um, mention some examples from the English speaking world in our own time. What is interdisciplinary about today's talk and my work is that these are lessons that come from the intersection point between the study of history, law, and forensic science. I want to structure my talk today uh, by looking at credibility challenges through the life cycle, you could say, of forensic fields. And so I'll be moving through the life cycle from the formation of a field to how it kind of continues, its influence even when the context changes. And then finally, I'll look at what happens to certain forensic fields when they have become very powerful and very widely accepted. And I'm looking at this historically, but also a little bit today, as I mentioned. And so let's start with forensic field formation. Here I want to talk about forensic science and empire. 
because colonialism played a special role in the formation of a number of forensic fields. You may already be familiar with the story of forensic fingerprint analysis. Uh, that is a technology that actually emerges out of colonial Bengal and then comes to the wider world. Um, and there's a great book on that that I'll mention at the very end if you want to hear more about that. So a lot of people know that story, uh, but you may be less familiar with these two other examples that I want to tell you about. And the really big message here, of course, is that it's not just a matter of technologies emerging in England and then uh, just being disseminated and circulated uh, in the larger British Empire. It was a lot more complicated than that. There's a lot more back and forth, cross-fertilization, adaptation, change as these technologies uh, move around the world. Now, in some cases, these technologies had uh, a much more active, vibrant, and early life in the colonies than in England. And so the first one I want to tell you about is um, the basis for an article that Pulami Badra mentioned um, that I published. It's about the history of a very interesting figure in India called the imperial serologist. The imperial serologist was a position created. He was based in Calcutta. The position was created around the time of the First World War, 1914-1916. And this was a forensic official, a forensic expert whose job it was to test blood stains for the criminal courts. Most of his work focused on a test called the precipitin test. And if you look at the image that I've got on your screen, that's a picture of the precipitin test. I can talk more about exactly how it was done in the q and if you're interested, but it, it used um, immunological response. And um, the precipitin test, the point of it was to establish the species of origin of a blood stain. So is this blood stain the blood of a human being or is it actually the blood of a bird or is it the blood of a goat? Okay, now the interesting thing about the imperial serologist is that uh, there was no other place in the British empire that had created a position and really institutionalized the importance of this kind of testing uh, this early. It wasn't for a couple of decades until other places started creating their own similar official. And certainly in England, precipitin testing was, was really not, um, um, the courts had a lot of reservations about it, let's just say, until a couple of decades later. Whereas in India, it had this very active life. It was used in courts. Um, it was a success almost from the, the very beginning of the time that this figure was created. So the question is why? What was it about precipitin testing and species of origin of a blood stain? Why was that so important in India? And how did this kind of forensic science get, therefore, jump-started in India and not elsewhere? Well, the answer uh, comes down to a classic colonial stereotype um, that scholars like Elizabeth Kolsky have called native mendacity. British colonizers in India had a deep-seated belief that colonized people, South Asian people, either couldn't tell the truth or wouldn't tell the truth didn't value truth telling in the way that Europeans did. And so that in itself is a huge driver for the turn to forensic science. From the mid 19th century, there's a big wave of treatises of medical jurisprudence for India, and then a whole bunch of institutions get created for forensic officials in India. And a lot of that is about trying to lean on science as a way of avoiding this problem of native mendacity. Because if you could rely on scientific tests and scientific experts in the courtroom, uh, then uh, perjury and forgery in the courtroom mattered a little bit less. Okay, so that's the big idea. Specifically, the bloodstain story was that forensic officials, British officials, were um, kind of obsessed with identifying cases where animal blood had been planted on the clothing or at a crime scene, particularly in murder, murder cases. So the idea would be that animal blood would be planted on a person's clothing, and then that person could be framed for murder. Um, the precipitant test allowed colonial officials to say, no, this is probably a case of planted evidence because this blood on this piece of clothing is not human, it's actually avian, it's bird blood. Bird blood is the most common one that was used. 
So you can see how um, you can see how the kind of the colonial context, colonial stereotypes, and perceived colonial uh, imperatives of sustaining rule uh, are driving the institutional support and resources that went into this one particular forensic science. A second example comes from the broader British Empire. This is work by a legal historian called Benjamin Bloom. And he has looked at the use of dogs, the use of canine evidence. And he has found that there is a really fascinating imperial element to this history. He's looking not only at how dogs were used in tracking, that's kind of where dog, the use of dogs in criminal justice begins, you could say in the English speaking world, but then it also uh, migrates to other uses like using dogs to identify suspects in a lineup. And that of course was hugely complicated because you can't cross examine a dog in court. Um, you can't capture smell. Smell was then, and I believe remains today, a kind of little understood um, sensory phenomenon you could say. So there are a lot of issues with that. And yet dogs were used in these ways in the British Empire and they were not used in these ways in England. And he looks at South Africa and he looks at Palestine when it was under quasi-colonial rule with the League of Nations mandate system. And what he finds is that um, the, the British colonizing forces um, were in favor of using dogs. Uh, one reason was that they thought that colonized people were particularly frightened about dogs and were either superstitious about dogs or had um, religious reasons for considering dogs polluting. Um, he also looks at a big anti-colonial revolt in the late 1930s in Palestine called the Arab Revolt. Uh, and these dogs were relied upon heavily by the authorities in um, law enforcement putting down that revolt. So this is also a story about very much kind of colonial framing and colonial priorities, jumpstarting particular forensic sciences, as I said. Second phenomenon I wanna talk about is um, establishing credibility in court. Here, the challenge has been for many forensic sciences, and it continues today for new forensic sciences, how to, um, how to get themselves uh, accepted by scientific lay people in court. And so that means judges in the colonial period, it also meant juries in India, and it means lawyers as well. And it seems that the challenge is one of intellectual accessibility. So the contrast that I see in my work is between sciences that I'm calling suspect sciences, like handwriting analysis, uh, and the contrast is with lab-based sciences like serology, toxicology. The handwriting analysis um, experts had a really hard time getting their work accepted in court. And it was admitted, I'm not saying it wasn't admissible, but I am saying that it was hard to get judges in particular to give this evidence weight, uh, to give it respect. And the problem was in a sense that these forms of analysis were too accessible. So I have cases where judges would um, put a, a pane of glass over a, a piece of writing and show that they could actually uh, replicate it in certain ways themselves. So the judges themselves were kind of jumping in there and saying that we don't really need experts. This is not scientific. We don't need experts in this new and emerging field because even I myself, a layperson, a judge, can, can show you what is possible and not possible when it comes to handwriting analysis. And so the handwriting analysts in response, in an, in an attempt to really assert their authority, uh, did things like they leaned on math, they tried to scientize through the use of numbers. Uh, you see the use of statistical evidence, probabilistic statements kind of creeping into their treatises. You also see them creating a bunch of fancy machines, <laughs> which it turns out were really just magnifying glasses, but um, it's kind of the, the, the paraphernalia that might make a person think of the lab. Um, and they also leaned on the lab aspect of their work, which is really just work on paper and ink. Most of their work had to do with writing. In any case, in the early 20th century, the government uh, examiner of question documents gets created as an official, but then he has a very hard time in court. By contrast, you have these lab sciences, and the lab sciences uh, enjoyed such respect that they had even a special privilege. Section 510 of the Criminal 
procedure code. It was then subsection 510. Today, it's a different section, section 293 of the same code. But at that time, section 510 allowed chemical examiners, the toxicology specialists, and the imperial serologists to submit a written certificate with their findings and to not be called into court for cross-examination. And that actually became the standard practice that courts would not call them in for cross-examination. So there's a huge divide between the kind of trouble that the handwriting analysts got on the one hand and the privilege, the privilege to hide in their labs, you could say, for um, the, the serology and the toxicology experts. So there's a sweet spot, I would argue. Uh, if you're too accessible, this is the lesson you could say, if you're too accessible as a new forensic science, there's a risk that um, courts won't accept that you even need to have experts. On the other hand, if we just step back for a minute, there's also a risk of being too inaccessible. If you think of DNA analysis before it became widely accepted, you could see this phenomenon. So in 1995 in the US, the trial of OJ Simpson, um, kind of the last point before DNA analysis becomes well accepted and well known. One of the reasons that OJ Simpson succeeded and was acquitted in the criminal case was that his lawyer appealed to the jurors and said, what is this DNA business? I don't understand it. Do you understand it? If you don't understand it, are you really willing to hand the outcome of the case to this expert? I don't think you should. And they didn't, okay? So you can be too, access in you can be too accessible and that's a problem, but you can also be too inaccessible and that's a problem. And new forensic science needs to be accessible enough that the lay people can follow along with what is happening and yet there still needs to be some special skill involved that requires an expert. I guess that's the lesson there. Um, the next phenomenon I wanna talk about, I call credibility migration. And this happens when a forensic science builds up its authority in one context, but then the context changes and somehow the authority kind of carries over. And you know, perhaps it shouldn't. I'd like to suggest that this is something to be cautious about. So as I mentioned, Forensic fingerprint analysis emerges out of colonial Bengal. An official called William Herschel notices um, that fingerprints have been used as kind of like a signature um, and that they are unique, or he thinks they are unique. Uh, and then it gets picked up and used uh, abroad, including in England, to identify prisoners who might be using aliases, so um, coming into prison. And there, what they would do is they would take the prints of the 10, 10 fingerprints of a person, that would be the reference um, sample. And then when a, when a pur purportedly new person came into the system, they would again take 10 very well inked prints. The migration happens from that kind of um, identification-based bureaucratic context. It was first used in pensions. Then it migrates to the crime scene. And there, what we're talking about is something very different. That is no longer a set of 10 prints, but a single fingerprint a latent print, perhaps a fragment of a single print. Of course, the chances of two people having the same fragment of a print are much higher than two people having 10 fully inked prints. So there's a migration in context, the context changes. And yet by this point, fingerprinting has so well established its authority for much of the 20th century, all across the English speaking world, fingerprint analysis was kind of considered the gold standard. And so it's riding on that earlier authority even when the context changes, and even when it perhaps should have been scrutinized with a little more rigor in the courtroom. A much more extreme example of this comes from our own time, forensic odontology. So that's the study of teeth uh, for forensic purposes. This field started with the uh, identification of bodies, including after disasters, where you have a, a body or a bunch of bodies, you don't know who the people are, um, and you would compare the teeth in the skull to dental records, that's how it began. Its authority kind of builds up in that context historically. But then they start using a very different context and that is bite mark evidence. So in a murder or in a rape case where the uh, aggressor bites the victim and you get bite, mark, bite marks on live tissue or dead tissue, right? But that is a very, very different thing from the identification of dental records in which this science emerges. And a number of my colleagues at the University of Wisconsin, we have an innocence project team who look at wrongful convictions and they've done work on wrongful convictions that happened because of this forensic odontology evidence, this bite mark 
evidence. So I think now we're starting to question the value of that evidence, but I think the way it happened was through this credibility migration phenomenon. The final stage I want to look at is the consolidation of authority of a forensic field historically. And these are situations where the forensic field of analysis becomes so well established that um, it is given certain privileges and um, there's a certain kind of complacency, just a ready acceptance without again, rigorous scrutiny being applied. Uh, the first example comes from a research. Now, of course, when this happens, you are perhaps at heightened risk of misconduct slipping through. And misconduct is the umbrella term, but of course, corruption is a kind of subspecies of misconduct. It's often very difficult to tell the difference between uh, negligent, sloppy behavior and actually corrupt behavior. But I have a case from 1893 in Madras the assistant chemical examiner in Madras, his name was W.S. Newman. And he, um, he got in trouble for a couple of things. One was that he was drinking the alcohol he was supposed to be testing for customs and excise. Not an unusual phenomenon. If any of you followed the case of Sonia Farak in Massachusetts in 2014, she was doing the drugs she was supposed to be testing. Um, but the other thing that Newman got in trouble for was that he wrote a sloppy chemical examiner's report he tested a chopper, a chopper that had been uh, possibly a murder weapon. It had been found in a sewer. So they thought that there might be blood along the edge, but then the rest of the chopper had been kind of sitting in a sewer for several, some time. And so he wrote a misleading report that made it sound like he had, he had um, tested the entire chopper for blood. And in fact, he hadn't. Uh, and the problem was this was a death penalty case. This was a murder case. Uh, and a sloppy chemical examiner's, examiner's report uh, could slip through because of the incredible privilege given to people in Newman's position. That is, as I mentioned earlier, the section 510 of the criminal procedure code, which allowed a written report to be sent in with the, without the expert being cross-examined in court. So he is dismissed, um, but the reason this happens in a sense is because his field is given this incredible amount of power uh, which allows um, courts to get sloppy, you could say. The other thing that can happen if we just um, adopt a term used by uh, historians of science is called black boxing. Black boxing is the phenomenon where a um, science becomes so well accepted that it's like it's operating in a black box and we stop asking questions about what is happening inside, about the inner workings. And so today, DNA analysis, I would say, is kind of the black box science. Um, and yet things like contamination of swabs can happen. I'm a little over time. So uh, you can go and read up about the Phantom of Heilbronn, which is a notorious case in Germany where the swabs were actually infected, were contaminated with the material of a person working in the plant and they didn't figure it out for a long time. There's also the risk of planted and even fabricated DNA evidence. So black boxing is very risky because we stop asking questions. Um, with these most well accepted forensic sciences. Okay, just to wrap up. So why does history matter? What does it have to offer forensic? Well, well, fields of knowledge have their own aspirations, their own challenges, life cycles, and history. Specifically, they get launched, they struggle, there are risks if they become too well established. Sometimes some of these colonial era rules like section 510, which is now section 293 of the criminal procedure code are still with us today. Other times you might see a repeated pattern in the history that is useful as we think about new forensic sciences that are establishing themselves today. I often think about uh, forensic linguists who are in court trying to interpret emojis for courts and I wonder if they are having some of the same struggles as what the handwriting analysts had in the early days. So the big lesson is that it's good to be conscious of the dynamics and patterns that build credibility of a forensic field. And it's good to be careful even with the most gold standards of fields. Um, I'm gonna end now. I've just got a couple of um, readings for you if you're interested in reading more. If you're not able to get um, the articles that I've listed here, which are coming out of this book, um, Global Forensic Cultures, I would encourage you to email the authors because scholars are usually very happy to share PDFs of their publications if you don't have access. So Benjamin Bloom is in California. Um, 
Projit Mukherjee is at the University of Pennsylvania and I'm at Wisconsin. Please email us if you would like copies of our articles and the Sengupta book should be available in India. Thank you, I will leave it there. I'll leave the screen up for a little bit while we start with questions. Thank you, Dr. Sharafi. This, uh, this is actually a very broad topic of what you're talking about. Um, the, the, it just lends itself so well to the storytelling, um, which unfortunately we couldn't cover. So I would request the participants to drop in any um, questions they have on the chat box. And um, meanwhile, okay, so we have one question about um, how do we find your email address? Um, yes. Yeah, I'm adding it right now. But it is surprising that uh, when, when you say about the issues that, that of course, forensics, well, some of the forensic disciplines did develop heuristically uh, because the police needed certain sciences to be used uh, in uh, solving cases. And, and fingerprints, which is by far one of the most used and most relied upon uh, uh, disciplines and techniques is, is also being brought into question. Uh, thankfully, we have that 2009 report from um, the National Academy of Science, uh, which has brought forward the, the issues with existing practices and forensic disciplines and what we can do to improve them. But when you mention uh, these incidents, um, I, I don't know if Dr. Goswami would agree because he is actually a practicing, uh, he, he was in the field more than me, I'm a researcher, uh, but I don't think the case with India has evolved um, that much. Uh, from my research, from my very limited research, what I do know is that uh, despite its golden standard, uh, DNA has not found a place in, um, in, in the courts, not that rampantly, uh, much because of the cost of doing DNA analysis and they don't fit even in case budgets more often. And also because when you do present a, a complex evidence such as DNA in court, most of the times, um, I think what you meant by is like um, scientific literacy, uh, lawyers, judges, uh, we do not deal with juries here, but either way it, it does, does not, um, I mean, they do not uh, know how to take that evidence uh, very well. Although increasingly there are several judgments where uh, judges have done a wonderful job of understanding uh, the, the complexity of DNA and molecular biology. Uh, but yes, when you mentioned uh, the same thing that you mentioned about uh, uh, Simpson, um, I mean, Simpson's was, there were lots of factors that, that uh, rode on that case and, and Simpson being um, not found guilty. But even, I don't know if you're familiar or if the other audiences, for the sake of the other audiences, were, Charlie Chaplin um, had a paternity case with, uh, I forgot the name of the lady, but I think the daughter was called Carol Ann. And DNA, and, and very simply, uh, blood serology, not even uh, DNA, but blood serology proved that Charlie Chaplin could not be uh, her father, and just because the court did not understand, um, blood, I mean, the type blood typing science that well, and because the person who was um, in in the court um, on the father's side was a very powerful, famous figure, uh, he ended up paying child support for a child who was scientifically not his. So it's a, it's a long way that science has come in, in courts, but of course there's a longer way uh, for uh, it to go. Um, we have one question from, uh, uh, sorry, let me just get the, from Jagadish Kumar. If the person has a, I think it's on fingerprinting. Um, I think they're, they're asking questions about scarring and, you know, temporary wounds that then heal and if that would result in um, changes in fingerprint patterns, because you, you spoke about fingerprinting. Um, do, you, do you see, because um, I've seen some of the, uh, the older report from the colonial eras on fingerprints and uh, those were from laborers who worked the field, so very scarred, very, um, 
calloused hands as well. So do you, uh, how do you uh, go, and, and I imagine that the prints are not of the top quality and quality of prints actually does matter when you're making uh, comparisons. So what are your comments on, on wounds or scarring or calousing that, and how do they present in, in the historical fingerprints? Yeah, thank you for that question and for your comments um, earlier. I think uh, the question I'm seeing is about like how a wound would affect handwriting potentially. I, I think that probably uh, a wound on a finger or a thumb would affect potentially both things. And it is possible, as you say, to kind of wear off the fingerprint through the type of work that a person is doing. So I think those are, those are challenges for fingerprint analysis. I know that um, in the handwriting analysis work, there was uh, a lot of discussion about um, sickness and if a person is too ill, how does that affect their writing? And uh, I imagine a wound would kind of be part of that as well. So I think those are all um, um, challenges that analysts in those fields uh, deal with and historically have dealt with. If I could just um, touch upon two things that you mentioned in your comments, Pulami. Um, one is uh, the Charlie Chaplin story is a fascinating case. And if you don't know about it, people in our audience, you should go read up on it. It's a story about blood group testing because of course blood group testing could exclude uh, paternity rather than establishing it, right? You could say this man could not possibly be the father of this child, um, but you could only say that, um, or you could say, well, he might be, but not that he definitely was. So I think the Charlie Chaplin case is also a story about the jury because there are many women on the jury and Charlie Chaplin had a reputation for being a womanizer. And so I kind of wonder if the jury at a certain point said, well, we don't really care. The science is one piece of this, but there's another piece of it, which is kind of social context and the fact that this man needs to be responsible to some child, even if it's not his own. It's a very interesting case. I'll also just say, I think there's a problem with legal education kind of worldwide. Uh, and that is that it's um, so divorced from science, right? A lot of people end up going into law instead of medicine because they don't think of themselves as good at science and math. And this becomes a problem then when you have scientifically sophisticated material being presented uh, in court. So I think this is an ongoing kind of struggle to properly educate lawyers and judges who may be a pool of people almost from the beginning who have avoided science. Yeah, that was technically what I do here. So I teach at the Tindall Global Law School and we are a social science university, but my job here is to supplement the legal education and, and uh, and present the scientific information in a way that is relevant to them and the way that they need to use it and know it because I'm again not making forensic scientists but I think that checks and balances between both the professions is very important. I know that at least from the Indian case studies a lot of experts uh, testify in court and get away with uh, maybe corruption as you mentioned but also get away with uh, biased and prejudiced uh, opinions, and they are not biased and prejudiced intentionally, but just uh, uh, subconscious biases that do persist in, in, uh, in um, and, and there is no checks and balance presented from the other side about countering this bias at the time of trial. So you're very right to say that there needs to be a little bit more exchange between uh, both the fields. We have one question from Leanne Almeida. Uh, and, and, and I, I don't know if you know about the McCann case, of, uh, which is a British Portugal investigation. So he wants to know about, he or she, I'm not sure. Um, they want to know about the reliability of the cadaver dogs in the McCann's case. Mm. But I don't know what that case is about, so. Yeah, thanks. I am not familiar with that. Oh yes, I am familiar with that case. Yes, that's actually a little girl who she disappeared uh, at a time when I was living in England myself. And so I remember there was a lot of publicity, a little girl with her parents in, in Portugal, they're tourists and she disappeared. And for many years, there was a hunt to find her. There were accusations made against the parents for a while. Um, so I, let's see, I'm not familiar with the cadaver dog use specifically in the case, but I will say that I think it's really important to distinguish when we look at the use of dogs Dogs are used in a huge variety of areas in forensics, of course. There's the tracking, there's the identification in lineup. Some parts of the US are still doing that, believe it or not. But then there's dogs used in drug cases, of course. There's dogs used in customs. There's dogs used in um, 
explosives, uh, a lot of ballistics work also when they're detecting gunpowder, like on an item of clothing by someone who shot a gun. And then there are the cadaver dogs. And I think what's really important is to distinguish between the kinds of um, canine evidence that can be um, confirmed or tested by some other means and the kinds that cannot. And so for instance, like in the drugs context, if you can, if the dog purports to find something and you can then test that in the lab, I think that I myself, I'm much more comfortable with the use of dogs in that context than in like a lineup where there may be no other way to confirm what the dog is asserting. Um, cadaver dogs, um, I think fall somewhere in the middle of that. Uh, I did recently read about dogs used to find cremains, cremation ashes in the ashes of a larger fire. And that I found just fascinating. So you could be looking for ashes of human remains within ashes of other things. Um, that's kind of a variation on the cadaver dog context perhaps. That, that is very interesting. I didn't know that cadaver dogs were used for that. But um, yes, like you mentioned, I do feel like there is a lot of, um, if you would call it science, although do dogs are people like living things, uh, but there are, there, are, uh, there are scientific techniques and one of the, I think you would agree as well, is something like polygraph or brain mapping, which is somewhat being used in uh, investigations of even post um, conviction. But what is still being questioned in court as a forensic technique, just because it doesn't mean a lot of what we call valid, valid, validity and reliability uh, criteria, which means that it can't be um, admissible. But there is a difference on science that you can use in investigative proce uh, procedures, uh, because most of our, um, I'm sure in all jurisdictions, you will be familiar with some cases where uh, maybe polygraph testing or truth theorem testing has been done, maybe not permitted in court as evidence, but any information gathered during such testing or interrogation that may have then led to other material evidences uh, would still be admissible in court. So there is a difference and forensic evidence overall has two roles to play, one in investigation in providing new leads and the second in proving the questions that the court wants. Who's done it? How did they do it? And did they mean to do it? So forensics works for both uh, and, and, it, and some sciences are good with one while still not being um, allowed in court to answer those questions. Um, that also, um, so we have another question from um, Anushree, uh, she claims it's a silly question. No question is silly. So um, a normal person sees a desk body and, uh, oh, I think it's a very personal question that a normal people uh, normally are very nauseous with dead bodies. So how do you uh, deal being around dead bodies during investigations? Well, I have not been around a lot of dead bodies because I am studying the, the history of it rather than, uh, I mean, I teach about the history and the contemporary and we have a, um, a, a really remarkable um, medical school colleague who's a forensic pathologist who always comes in and talks to the students and they have questions like this for him. Um, I will say that I've been struck in my own research by how um, I can read descriptions of dead bodies and terrible violence like in words, in text, I can kind of read it and think about it intellectually and I'm fine. But at a certain point in the 1950s in Indian forensic treatise publishing, they started putting a lot of images into, so a book like Modi's, um, Modi is still the author of this very important treatise on medical jurisprudence. Modi's edition starts all of a sudden using all these photos in the 1950s. And I'm always kind of struck by how, um, how sick it makes me feel when I see the images and how it's a very different experience to see images for me at least than to read about it. Um, yeah, I'll also just say, uh, Pulomi, on your, con on, your, on your comments about um, truth serum, there's a very, very interesting history and contrast between India and the US here because narcoanalysis truth serum uh, emerges in mid 19th century, mid 20th century um, Texas 
this obstetrician is, um, notices that a drug, he, uh, scopolamine that he would give women for childbirth, um, he thinks that a person can't tell a lie while they're on it. And then he really pushes it hard in the forensic context. It is not um, admissible in American courts today uh, as, as in India, um, but in, in America, it has a whole life outside of the courtroom, especially like in, um, excuse me, I'm talking about the polygraph machine now, excuse me. Neither the polygraph machine nor truth serum have a life in Indian courtrooms today as admissible evidence. Um, truth serum, as far as I can tell, is completely out of the context in the US. But in India, as you say, it is used even if it's not admissible. The polygraph in the US has a life in employment context, even if it does not have uh, a life in the courtroom anymore. If you wanna read a great book about this, uh, Ginny Lokanita, who is a political scientist, just recently published a book on the life of truth serum in India. Highly recommend it. Uh, could, could you write down the name of the author in the chat box just so everybody gets the right spelling of the yes. name? Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, uh, so truth serum is not admissible, of course, in, in, in India. It's, um, it's a voluntary test that can be considered uh, in certain investigations. In, in fact, one of Dr. Ashwin Kumar's uh, investigation on the Talwar case uh, had a lot of people who were uh, suspected undergo voluntary uh, tests, truth serum tests, narco analysis. Um, with regards to polygraph, that's very interesting because um, the, the standard polygraph that used to work on certain biophysical features has also lost credibility in the Indian courts, um, or maybe as a corroborative, uh, um, corroborative tool. But what um, what what we do now have is the fancier version called brain fingerprinting, and how's that holding up in um, in 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 the U.S. courts? I think it's referred to as F three hundred brain fingerprinting test. I um I have not I have not looked for it, but I've also not seen it, so I am not sure. I don't think it has. A major role in the U.S., but I—that's just um, that's a guess on my part. I would have to look into it. Possibly because it's maybe a, it's a much more new, newer, uh, relatively newer science. So maybe um, that will come up later in your historical studies. Um, uh, and and we have uh, some other questions about how your history, uh, historical research has assisted you uh, in the modern context in your contemporary work. So how do you bring the historical research on crime and forensics into the contemporary legal education and, and studies? Well, most of my students in my forensics course are not history students. They are, we have an, for us, a law degree is a second degree, it's a graduate degree, but there's an undergraduate degree you can do not to become a lawyer, but just to learn about law and society, and it's called legal studies. So most of my legal studies students do not come with an instant kind of interest in history, and I have to really convince them why history matters. On the very last day of the class, we always um, look at current events and we connect them to um, some of the longer historical debates. Uh, two of my favorite kind of lessons that I emphasize with them are, first of all, that you need to be very cautious about ultra fashionability of ideas and techniques. Um, and we talk about the eugenics movement worldwide, which um, led to, of course, uh, the Holocaust um, in the Second World War. But in the U.S., it led to the um, coerced sterilization of tens of thousands of people who were deemed uh, eugenically unsound. Uh, and so we talk a lot about, um, uh, and that was considered and understood as very kind of scientific scientifically solid field at the time. So people thought they were being very cutting edge to be eugenicists. Um, but it turns out, uh, so the lesson there, I guess, is that um, uh, if there's some ultra fashionable school of thought that especially that pulls against basic um, norms of human rights and dignity, you need to really think carefully um, about it. The other thing that's really important is that it's really important for um, forensic science and uh, police to be in constant conversation. Again, kind of a project of constantly educating, raising scientific literacy on the part of 
policed because of course science is always changing and, and a common theme in the history of forensics is that um, police even sometimes have almost magical thinking about what is possible in forensics and it'll turn out not to be possible. And then suddenly there'll be some scientific advance and it will be possible. So you need kind of a tight um, relationship and constant education, I guess both of the lawyers and the judges and of the police when it comes to forensic science. Those are two big lessons for today coming from history. Um, so uh, from the same speaker, we have another question about uh, what are the gaps uh, when you are doing your research, especially because you were doing it from afar. So um, mostly your accessibility uh, is uh, to information is also something that needs to be considered. But what are the gaps with which you start struggle when you are doing this kind of research? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would say I don't really think of it in terms of, yeah, so put it this way, the archival, what has survived in the archive is so spotty that it's not a matter of there being gaps. It's more a matter of like, what are the bright spots that I can actually capture and understand, right? Because the, the rest is all gaps. And so this is a question and a problem, I think, for any kind of archival researcher. There are all sorts of factors that feed into what makes it and what doesn't make it into the archive. There are deliberate um, destruction of record projects that happen in any institution, like in courts, in the high courts. Um, once I was reading along, I worked a lot in the Bombay High Court for my first project, and I came across a mention of how, you know, we destroyed thousands of records today to make room for more case records. And of course that is just heartbreaking for a historian. It's agonizing because that was my material and it's been destroyed, but it's an, a busy institution that's generating more case law all the time. So there are those kind of efforts, but then there's also political reasons that certain kinds of information survives and doesn't. Uh, I know at the National Archives of India, if you try to look into sometimes like property related disputes you might hit up against, um, things that are sensitive and you just can't get the information. Um, and then there's also just colonial state priorities, which is um, obsession with employment. <laughs> I feel like at least half of the colonial archive at the National Archives of India and the British Library in London is about pension, promotions and leave. <laughs> and so uh, employment is a huge kind of um, obsession. And so all of these things produce a particular set of records, which it's true, I can't just go down the street in the place where I live and look at them whenever I want. I have to make a trip to Delhi or Mumbai or London. Um, but we're historians, we're not you know, social scientists generating our own data sets. So we kind of take whatever we can find. And I will say also that um, in recent years, archives are gradually shifting over to allowing people to take scans with their phones and that has revolutionize the amount of work we can get done. So the British Library, you're allowed to do that. National Archives of India, I hope soon they'll <laughs> come around to the same decision. Right now, they're not, they're not allowing it. Um, but that also means that uh, visiting our scholars can get a lot more stuff when they do make a trip to the archives. And, and may I suggest to ed everyone to follow uh, Dr. Sharafi on Twitter because she always uh, often shares um, access sources to South Asian archives, uh, some of which I think that I have found useful, the ones that she has shared recently. So I would suggest that you do follow her on Twitter. Um, she's always very generous with her knowledge and, and, and she shares with her audience a lot. So some of these are things that you could use. Um, we'll take one last question, um, although uh, we are kind of uh, at the end of our uh, talk, but this is a very interesting question from um, Dr. from Abunja Sabali about what are some of the legal challenges of forensic science that you feel um, the history tells you is where forensic science um, does not cope with the requirements of the law. Yeah, well, the big thing I'm focusing on, one big thing in my book is this, this, um, this section I talked about, section 510 of the Criminal Code of Procedure, where you know some experts get to not come to court, whereas others have to come to court and are really grilled 
um, and why, why would certain sciences get that privilege when others wouldn't? That's one thing that I'm interested in. Like I said, that continues on to India, into, into present Indian law today, can has continued with that rule. Um, I will say there's a really big problem. This is not quite so much coming out of my historical research, but it's definitely in my teaching. There's a big problem coming out uh, with um, all of the matching sciences. And this is really, um, this is really the one of the big conclusions of that report that Pulami Badra mentioned um, from about a decade ago by the National Academy of um, Science in the U.S., which is that um, many forensic sciences that are um, matching two samples, whether it's fingerprints or hair analysis or shoe print analysis, um, what's happening is that. Um, a human being is kind of doing similarity analysis where they're looking at these two things and saying, are these two things similar enough in ways that matter? Uh, and the point of that report was that this is more art than science. It's highly subjective. They've done experiments where they've sent the same samples to the same experts at different times and gotten different results. Um, on the fingerprinting front, the Madrid bombing case of, I guess it was maybe one or two decades ago now, is a story about the fallibility, I think, of fingerprint analysis and even how there's a lot of disagreement within the fingerprint analysis community about how to do it properly. How many points do you use? Do you even use points? Do you use a kind of holistic look? And, and there, there was a, a conflict between the American authorities and the, the European, the Spanish authorities who had different ways of analyzing fingerprints. So. I think all of the matching sciences, there's a lot of reason to be concerned. It's also really interesting to note that um, many of these fields only exist in the forensic or legal context. They don't really have a life in the world of academic peer reviewed science. And so in that way, they're very different from fields like you know, toxicology DNA, serology, which are, there's peer reviewed scientific research being done in those fields, but there really isn't for these matching fields. They only exist in this forensic context. So I think that the distinction between different forensic sub fields is a very um, worthwhile way of approaching this. Yeah, that, that's a very um, important thing that you mentioned here uh, about um, the, the difference between um, forensic, all forensic science as scientists, like uh, for, as coming from the science part of it, I can tell you that um, whatever we give is at best a probability opinion, and that's why it qualifies as an opinion and not a fact. And, and it's an opinion because it is at every, no matter how good the technique, the scientific technique be behind it, it is subject to some kind of human fallacies or human cognitive biases. And that's what, you know, essentially, I mean, with the, with the Brandon Mayfield case, a lot of things were wrong. Um, there were a lot of factors, but at some point, yes, definitely the, there needs to be a study of the forensic evidences and forensic sciences, but from a very holistic sociological, uh, psychological perspective as well. Um, so this has been a very good discussion. Um, I will write to you uh, about a lot of ideas that I would want to talk about now, but probably I shouldn't. Uh, so I will write to you later following up on, um, on more of this. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry if I made you wake up really early. Dr. Namika and Dr. Sarafi have been awesome. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in with us uh, from the USA. And we'll take a very short break. We'll come back at the Indian Standard Time 6.05 uh, in about three minutes. And we'll be joined by Dr. Goswami, um, an IPS officer, a former joint director at CBI, and currently the DGP at uh, Uttar Pradesh. So we will be hearing more on forensics and its role in the law from the Indian perspective. So maybe this is something that Dr. Sharafi would, um, it would be pertinent for you to hear. So to everybody, uh, we'll just return um, in three minutes. Just taking a quick break here. Thank you so much.
Um, Dr. Goswami, are we good to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Um, so thank you all for joining us. I know there was a lot of questions for that some of you had. Uh, Maris spoke about convict criminology. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't take that question. Uh, but maybe you could uh, put it to Dr. Brisky tomorrow, who would perhaps who, who works in that area and would be better able to answer that question. But I know there were a lot of other questions that are uh, very interesting questions that we are not able to take today. Um, Dr. Sharafi has been kind enough to drop the link for the Innocence Project. Uh, so that question is answered. Uh, but I will, after I log off, I will try and put the questions that we did not answer and um, send you the answers later on. So moving forward, we have our last speaker for today, um, Dr. G.K. Goswami. Some of us are, from, at least from India, might already be familiar um, with Dr. Goswami, who's currently in the role of Inspector General of Police at the UP. Um, he is fascinatingly, he has a, he's, he has an LLM degree. He also has a doctorate degree in uh, medical chemistry. And also I think he's currently doing a doctoral studies in law. So uh, as they say, you never stop learning. Uh, he was the joint director of anti-corruption um, branch at the CBI. And previously, he was also joint director at uh, CBI Lucknow and CBI Academy, and the director of the CBI Academy at Ghaziabad. Uh, he was also um, an expert on organized crimes at UNODC and has been honored with the second bar by the Honorable President of India and was decorated three times uh, with a police medal for gallantry. He's also been awarded for his meritorious service um, and um, by the governor of uh, Uttar Pradesh. And he has been pursuing, he's one of the few police officers who despite the pressures of their job have also pursued academic research um, in, in full fledged during uh, their uh, work. So uh, Dr. Goswami has um, I have personally heard him over so many um, symposiums and conferences, and I have always been impressed that he's one of the few practitioners who has been exploring the interface of law and science. And uh, uh, we are all familiar with his uh, publications. He's very widely published. Um, one of his books just recently came out. Um, I know he's uh, doing another one for Springer on, on DNA. Uh, to which I am working with uh, on one chapter for him. So um, we all look forward to listening from you, Dr. Goswami. And um, now can I hand it over to you? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Palomi. And on the onset, I must congratulate uh, to OP Jindal Global University for organizing such a beautiful uh, webinar and particularly I congratulate you to identify global expert, especially Professor Anamika and Professor Mitra Sarafi. And I am amazed by their vast knowledge and particularly Professor Mitra, his knowledge about the Indian law, the anecdotes he explained about Indian you know, background and the legal landscape. I was really um, amazed. It was uh, very nice listening to them. And I will try to connect. I was attempted to ask few questions, but I thought that let the, uh, the viewer must have the first right to ask questions with, with being the limited scope of time. But I will use her you know, statements or observations in my presentation as well, as and when things get required. So I will begin. And I will try to complete it at, uh, within the stipulated time, though the content is maybe a little more, but I will try to uh, do the justice with the subject as well as the time limit. So, uh, Thank 
you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see the slide as well. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so the, my subject is basically allied science in the advancement of criminal law. Okay. So my dear friends, we have observed in general that police file charge sheet based on the evidence collected in different offensive, different crimes. But many a times, though charge sheet does not fructify in conviction. And if you see this statistics over this PPT, uh, this express the rape incidents in last four or five years in India. And on left side, the charge sheet police had filed in nearly 90% cases, but it ultimately the conviction rate is nearly 30%. So the issue why we are talking about the intervention of forensic science or any allied science in legal domain is how to bridge this gap, this charge sheet and conviction. That means the quality of evidence needs some improvement. That is the take why we are here to discuss the point. Likewise, the POXO Act, POXO Act is especially for child sexual abuse in India. It, it came in 2012 after enactment and especially alignment with the UNCRC 1989. Here also the scenario is same, charge sheet in 90%, 95% cases and conviction only 30 to 35%. Again, the same scenario. Similarly, if we see the human trafficking, why I am talking about human trafficking here? Because human trafficking has direct linkages with uh, rape incidents and different kind of exploitation and crime involved, whether it is a child, whether it is a major person, male, female, anybody. So human trafficking is a global bundle of crime and is a big threat to the humanity. And I think in Indian scenario, they probably charge sheet is around, if you see the central part, charge sheet is around 20, 25% and conviction is again the same. So the same scenario again appears here. So not only in India, if you see the entire globe, the, 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 the difference between filing charge sheet and conviction is always a haunting and daunting task. And we need to have some better quality of evidence. And that is why, why we need forensic science and allied science into courtroom. So that is the basic purpose to talk about today's discussion. Now, investigation is basically collection of evidence in criminal domain, right? But we need fairness because if we talk about what is law or what are the attributes of law, in Indian scenario, not only in India, but globally, there are three basic attributes of law. If I say I am legally correct, so what are the, the, the attributes or characteristic to qualify my sentence or to qualify my act uh, for that matter? So one should be just second reasonable and third fair. That means any act, if it is called legal, then it should emanate justice. Second, fairness. If it is transparent, unbiased, then only it is legal and it should be reasonable. So these three things are basically a quintessence of justice and we have to develop our entire discourse on these three buzzwords. Now, let us talk about human identification and why it is relevant for our purpose today. You see, in, in, in any investigation, whether it is civil matter or criminal matter, human identification is the central and focal point. Why? On one side, we are tracing the, the correct or the true criminal who has actually committed crime. Even if a person is named in FIR, even then, the role of investigation, role of police or investigating agency is to correctly identify the human being. So on one side, that is the requirement. On other side, the victim side, if we see, 
there also we need to have correct identification of victim sometimes the victim may be defaced murdered and even sometimes the body remains like bones or many other part of body may be uh, traced but we have to connect without any doubt or beyond reasonable doubt that the person is x to whom we are talking so human identification is the central point of our investigation and we use different type of uh, you know am i audible yes yes you are audible okay because the uh, <laughs> i could not see any of you on the screen so i thought that there may be some technical glitch so morphological feature photography fingerprint seriology these are different technologies and techniques actually to utilize for human identification in different manner and of course as professor mitra said dna profiling is the latest one and we are using in india and i think across the globe day in and day out now another important point is the the investigation what is the purpose of investigation so investigation my dear friends is basically it is a process or you can say it is pursuit of truth basic objective behind investigation is to find truth and fairness as i mentioned fairness is again the focal point of scientific investigation so what is the purpose of forensic science is basically to bring fairness in investigation these are different other things and as uh, professor mitra mentioned about innocence project and all i think uh, uh, innocence project is very important because you know what is why it is important it is important because it provide justice to those who have wrongly been convicted and all appeal have been utilized but justice could not be delivered and this came after the advent of dna and in particularly in us one project was initiated innocence project and a report which is very important uh, called convicted by jury as generated by science this has turned around and is still in us and many other countries where innocence project is in progress more than 100 200 innocent person who are even in on death row are been found that they are innocent and they are being the, the the injustice has been corrected so that is the beauty of innocence project i think india does not have it and we should also think to introduce in indian climate now this is the scenario how the evidence are being utilized in india in general evidence may be classified as primary and secondary if this classification is being used then ocular witness is only and solely called primary witness primary evidence rest of the world will be secondary whether it is dna whether it is any forensic evidence any other oral oral uh, witness but in second classification generally it is called direct and indirect it is a little bit confusing but still this classification is also important and i mention primary evidence has the highest value in our legal system but in many cases my dear friends we do not get the ocular witness the reason is that it may be not possible like say for example rape rape if the victim is even alive she is the only victim but not a independent oral witness as the requirement of the law so how we can advance justice the the best thing is the circumstantial evidence and on circumstantial evidence these three four judgments which i have mentioned here poland in 1954 then sarat birdi chand in india in 1984 which gave pancila pancila means five guidelines and these are further judgments which are latest and it talks about the quality of evidence which can be used as circumstantial evidence in the administration of justice so circumstantial evidence has to be understood in a very you know right just manner if we are dealing with the delivery of justice in indian climate or anywhere in the world now this is another uh, story of oral testimony 
in indian system or any other country for that matter generally there is no limit of witness to prove or disprove a fact in india in indian evidence act we have section 1334 talking about this as i mentioned eye witness is called stalling witness but whether it is eye witness or any other oral witness they have limitation limitation of they may be having their personal grudges against the accused person they may be planted may be interested they may have the memory issues and so many other extraneous factor which may uh, you know create some you know limits of oral testimony in any case so as far as we are talking about imperfect the imperfectness of justice should be removed that means justice should be perfect then corroboration is the way out how we can bring transparency and reasonableness in our judicial system so corroboration is the hallmark and forensic science basically instill corroboration in our evidentiary system that is how this forensic business forensic science business is important for our courtroom proceedings this uh, i was talking about circumstantial evidence so this case is the latest one where earlier i told about bridgeton case there were five uh, guidelines but it has reduced into three and these are the basic attributes by which one evidence will be accepted in the court as circumstantial evidence you see about the science and law this interface none other than albert einstein has very beautifully mentioned that it has become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity i think this is very important hallmark as 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 professor mitra was mentioning about the historical perspective probably we should not think that anything is in, infallible we should use forensic science with open eyes and ears we cannot use it it as a blind faith i will talk why but this this saying of albert einstein has very important you know bearing on forensic science and forensic jurisprudence now let me talk about forensic science or criminologists forensic science is not a pure science it is a blend science as uh, professor mitra was saying she was talking about history she was talking about many other you know science uh, uh, amalgamating with forensic science so this is a, a a fusion science basically and it is baseline for scientific investigation if we talk about scientific world in investigation then definitely some kind of forensic inputs are required by doing this we enhance probability of evidence and entire process is basically an attempt to march toward perfect justice that is how forensic science actually attribute in our entire uh, trial proceedings now i will although my majority of job was completed by miss uh, professor mitra but i just thought Uh, to talk about some historical perspective and these are actually initially autopsy was introduced in court as a matter of science and none other than julius caesar when he was killed and there were 23 stabs reported by the medical legal expert at that time it was reported that chest injury was cause of death out of 23 injuries and these are another important aspect like in 1835 forensic ballistics were introduced in 1880 fingerprint which probably professor mitra was mentioning but first fingerprint in in criminal justice system was used by francis galton these are some you know landmark in 80s 18th century and then 19th century these are certain important you know milestones in the annal of uh forensic science so this just uh, just for your understanding and knowledge now let me give some 2 3 minutes on this slide because this is actually linking of science with law and that is called jurisprudence of forensic science my dear friends many of you may must be aware but many of you may not be having legal background so for them jurisprudence may be a new term let me explain juris means law and prudence means knowledge so understanding of law is 
subject matter of jurisprudence and here we are talking jurisprudence of forensic science in indian domain constitution and not only in india but in any country for that matter any constitution is the bible it is a it is the 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 parent you know statute by which the law are being enacted so in in our indian constitution and in every constitution you will uh, find this type of uh, you know uh, law that there are in our constitution there are three appendages of article 20 that is one is prospective effect that law cannot be uh, implemented from the retrospective effect suppose if i have not committed if i have committed some wrong i will, and the law is not existing on that day and subsequently it came into being then i will not be prosecuted that means it can be done only subsequent from the making of the law then i cannot be punished twice for the same crime or same offense but for our purpose this right against self incrimination is very very important for forensic view point why i will talk about this before i enter to that discussion let me talk about third degree and we all know about third degree third degree is violence by any law enforcement agency lea but that now the question arises what is first and second degree first degree my dear friends is basically a kind of general type of question being asked and degree and one first second third is basically it is quantification of torture and torture is usually two type one is physical torture which i mentioned already violence is not permitted in any law in any country and another one is mental torture so we only left with the second option and as i mentioned that if suppose a person is called at police station or any office for any interrogation or for any kind of query then one gets some stress mental stress and till time normal question are being asked it is first degree but the moment the law enforcement officer start cross questioning or confrontation you can say in interrogation term confrontation begins the second stage of you know mental torture and that is basically the hallmark of oral you know examination or interrogation of a person what i mean to say is that if you are doing scientific investigation and you are interrogating because forensic science cannot replace completely oral testimony or oral interrogation ultimately it has to be a blend it has to be mixed up so so how to interrogate a person scientifically is important and there i mean to say that if you have a proper questionnaire proper understanding of the background of the cases what other evidence are being there and if you have prepared a systematic questionnaire and then you cross examine a person or or uh, confront a person that is basically the proper investigation and those who fail to do that they generally resort to third degree and like that so those who are involved in the investigation please mind it that scientific investigation desire that proper you know questionnaire and proper material for confrontation when you call any 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 person for that matter for interrogation these three four cases which i have mentioned have very important role in forensic science in indian uh landscape of law kathikallu over talks about the fingerprint nandini sapati talk about right to silence or article 19 in indian constitution talk about right to speak or uh, but nandini sapati case has has identified and has enabled a person that if any incriminating question is being asked then you can maintain silence okay shall we we were talking uh, rather professor mitra was talking and polomi was also mentioning the deception detection technique like narco analysis then brain mapping then your polygraph or lie detector and many more techniques at this is stage let me tell you that all these techniques which are psychophysiological in nature basically they their findings per se are not admissible in any court anywhere although it needs detailed discussion but they basically provide you a ray of hope in very dark page like if it is a cold case you do not get any kind of 
uh, you know, uh, a clue for that, then probably these cases or these techniques can provide you some hope. And in Indian climate, in the Indian law, section 27 of Indian evidence that is called recovery. If you are successful for any recovery related to the crime material, right, crime evidence, then that part only out of these techniques may be admissible. But there are so, so many inverted commas and question mark. Then the last thing is Rite Sinha. Rite Sinha talk about the voice sample. And this is the very recent judgment. Basically, in Indian law, many, many techniques we use, but it does not have footprint in our legal system. I will talk in the next slides, actually. But Rite Sinha has given or empowered our magistrates to direct the subject to give a uh, voice sample. And that is very important, say, for calling ransom or for asking for any corrupt activities or many things. So voice matching is very important tool for connecting crime with criminal. But this judgment becomes, you can say, landmark judgment in the, in the history of India, Indian legal system, with, by which the, the, the provisions have been made uh, empowering the magistrate. These are basically right to privacy issue, although time is not too much, so I will restrict myself. But privacy has very important role. And you know, in, DN, in, in India, DNA bill could not be fructified or could not be enacted because of this privacy issue. So we should always understand that the, 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 the connectivity of right to privacy because it has been identified as a right as integral part of right to life. And these two judgments, Kukta Swami, uh, the same petitioner, has filed two judgments. Uh, one judgment came in 2017, another came in 2018, and it is called informational privacy. So these have very important connotation on Indian legal system, and that needs to be understood. Then, as I mentioned, consent. Consent is defined in uh, section 90 of IPC, but I believe that this definition is more towards uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, contractual matters and many more. I think for forensic purpose, this consent definition needs, uh, you know, reconsideration or revisit. And what are the criteria of uh, competent consent? The age, the person should be major. It should be sent, then it should uh, the consent should be free and voluntary, and it should be informed. Then again, a question that suppose if an accused I have given my consent, can I retract? This answer is not there in the law. So there are so many issues and challenges basically which we have to see. Like I mentioned about the Selby versus the state of Karnataka, it is considered Bible for these three techniques, but I have my own reservation that it needs reconsideration again. And uh, uh, the, the, the major reason why I always say that it re needs reconsideration, that the Latin maxim, if you see, that if you cannot do something directly, you cannot do indirectly. Very simple formula. The thing is that if our article 20 part three says that you cannot do this, then even if by consent, how can you do that? That is the simple logic, which I am actually writing one article. I think it will be published very soon. But this is, uh, people may think how to connect these techniques with consent and all. Because it is a global challenge, actually. Then these are about a qualifying test. This is Fry test, 1923, and Dover test. Everybody knows about this because these talk about reliability and legality of whatever we are doing in the laboratory. Uh, the question arises that if suppose X person, X scientist says that you please use my technology as, in the court as evidence, then what is the test? These are the two tests and now Dover test is considered much you know, higher test and normally used more, but it has own limitation. It, it talk about that court becomes like a gatekeeper. And court or the judges, they are not expert in that field. So there are so many challenges even that Dover test, but 
uh, of course, it needs more detailed discussion and all. Then let me talk about some legal framework issues and challenges in our forensic domain. Uh, first, let me talk about uh, the, the legal framework in India. My dear friends, law has two types of broad classification. One is called substantive law. Substantive law means where you define a particular offense and then also define the relative punishment or whatever, you know, alternative arrangement. Okay. And another set, uh, another set of uh, enactments or law are called procedural law. Procedural law are basically the process action. So you can say substantive law is the mean and procedural law are the means action. So in India, we have three major procedural law. One is CPC, which came into existence as old as 1859. Then comes here, I just give you one good example because a lot of things Professor Mitra talk about the history. So I just make you aware about the history. Our Indian Penal Code came into existence or came into being in 1860. And I prou proudly say then in majority of countries, our Indian Penal Code in more than 60 countries recorded, it had been imitated, many sections have been imitated. So after that, CRPC came in, 19, in 1861, but on record in general, it is being designated in 1898 and subsequently the, the amended version that we are using is in 1973. So these are the basic sections. Indian Evidence Act belongs to 1872, and Indian Evidence Act actually used for both criminal matters as well as civil matters. This is the difference to understand. Civil matter as well as criminal matter. But CRPC, we will talk about which sections they deal with the forensic part. They deal only for criminal matters. So this is the difference. Evidence Act for any type of crime or any civil dispute, but CRPC only for criminal matters. Section 45. Section 45, or for that matter, from section 45 to 51, deals with expert opinion. It does not use word forensic. Forensic word is only used in CRPC in few sections. I will talk about in the later. So what is the opinion of expert? And who is an expert? It may be in the foreign law, in science, even in art subjects, handwriting or finger impression. So these are only things mentioned where the expert can provide their opinion. Now, again, the issue comes that what about the other, you know, discipline of forensic science? This is again a question mark here. Likewise, section 46, it talks about fact bearing upon opinion of expert, but for our purpose here, we are more concerned about section 45. These are about different sections, uh, not much relevant because time is short, so I have to rush quickly. Now, let me talk about sex, CRPC, about criminal matters. So see the right side, section 291. 291 talk about the doctor. I mentioned that medical science, or you can say the postmortem came first. So probably here also, the opinion of doctor came first, but it is not called Witness. Doctors are not called witness actually. And even for that matter, none of the expert is called witness in the court. They are called only experts. And they are called, they are called generally deponents. So medical doctor is in section 291. And section 292 have the list that who are the witness and who are those officers. So this is the list. Officer of Mint, Note Printing Press, Security Printing Press, and all these. Here, any forensic department or FSL, forensic science laboratory, maybe state laboratory or central laboratory. So these are actually the name mentioned. Here again, not the DNA one, not no other, lot of other things, voice spectroscopy, ballistics, so many things are being left out. Now, again, see 293, uh, right side, 293 report of government scientific expert. Okay. 
uh, the, it's part one talk about the its evidence we value. But our 293 part four is relevant for us. Who are the expert? This is the list. Chemical examiner, this, this, this. These are the only identified ex experts. But the savior clause is 293 part four part G. Any other government scientific expert is specified by notification by the government. Here, this section actually covers the rest of the uh, experts, say DNA or any other thing. But my take is that it is better now we are, uh, you know, amending our law uh, in totality. I think now a separate chapter on forensic evidence should be attributed with detailed discussion so that there should be no confusion. Now, this is local principle. We know about this. Uh, it says that suppose if two things comes together, like say two bodies during rape or something like that, then they exchange some material, which becomes ultimately the subject matter to be collected and for analysis as expert opinion, for the expert opinion. So we can collect evidence, such samples from victim body or victim's place, accused place of occurrence and some other uh, uh, places where like section 27 recovery type. These are uh, few uh, probable evidence, this is an indicative list, which type of evidence we can collect, and it is not a very you know, exhaustive list, but it gives you a fair idea about what kind of evidence we can collect. Now, this is very important for the purpose of make, maintaining sanctity and probity of samples, chain of custody. This is the most important, and let me tell you very clearly that even if a very, very good analysis has been done, everything is very, very good in all respect. But if the defense lawyer is able to break chain of custody of the sample, then entire report becomes null and void. So the maintenance of chain of custody is the hallmark, my dear friends. And this is the procedure, although it needs a detailed discussion. I have uh, written an article on this on DNA. And those who have interested me, uh, Google my name uh, on ResearchGate. And then you can find a lot of uh, articles and other things. But let me clarify that one should understand those who are dealing with forensic science and criminal side of investigation or trial, and even for the defense lawyer also. They should understand the doctrine of chain of custody. It's very, very important and significant. This is the same issue. Now, in brief five, seven minutes, because this is very uh, core subject and very close to my heart. I have done a lot of research on this subject, how to use this thing. And uh, this is DNA and genetic informer. informer. It is a, a genetic eyewitness, you can say. Deoxyribonucleic acid, everybody knows. It, it's, it, it is found in the cell, in chromosomes, and its double helical structure was invented by Watson and Crick, who were being awarded Nobel Prize. And this science become basic for biotechnology and it is a science of wonder actually. As you see in different area of life, medicine, space, whatever you talk about and I think DNA will always be there so one way or other. This is the structure, ATGC and how they are being connected. Now, let me just give two minutes time here, how this DNA enter into courtroom. What, what are the background? Dr. Alex Jeffrey, very well known person, also known to me uh, as well nowadays. I talk to him sometimes. This fellow, very established scientist at that point of time in 1980s. The background was two adolescent girls of age 12, 13. In different instances in 1983 and 1985, they were being raped and brutally killed. And they were cold cases having no clue with the police who committed the crime. Incidentally, both cases landed with the same investigator. And one fellow during interrogation called uh, Richard Buckland, he was of at that time age of 20, 21, but had some mental uh, issue, not retarded, but some challenge, mental challenge. He, uh, he accepted before police of commission of one case. But somehow that investigator was not convinced. He contacted Dr. Alec Jeffrey. At that point of time, Jeffrey 
Dr. Jeffrey was involved in human identification by using DNA. But he had no business with the crime. They took this challenge. He requested to help. They took this challenge and they collected DNA sample. And when you collect sample from a particular population, then it is called DNA dragnet. Then they collected more than 3,000 samples. 3,000 individuals were called and samples were collected. In incidentally, one important and interesting thing happened at this point of time. In the evening, when this process was in pro progress, one fellow called Colin Pitchfork, again the same age of 2021, he was sitting on a tea stall and he disclosed one fact with his uh, friend sitting with him. He said that for this process of giving DNA sample or blood sample, I have sent my friend to impersonify me. And believe me, he successfully had done that job. Had he not disclosed this fact here, and this was passed on to police, and he was caught and was connected by, by uh, uh, this Alex Jeffrey's uh, results of DNA, and he ultimately was punished also. So that is how it, it entered into domain of law. Here, you just see two things. This DNA not only found the correct person who is the criminal, but also exonerated the innocent person, Richard Buckland. Had this was not been found, probably uh, based on his uh, you know, disclosure or acceptance of the crime, maybe he might have been sent to jail and who knows, he might have been convicted also. So this is how both innocence and criminality, both are being adduced to this new uh, invention of uh, crime tool, or you can say investigating tool or evidentiary tool. Now, this is a very small thing because I, I, I am dealing with the DNA and DNA is used for civil matters as well as criminal matters. So I thought appropriate to talk about what is criminal and what is civil. If any act or omission which is prohibited under law is called wrong, and up to that level, civil and criminal have the same attributes. But if a court dealing that matter allow for compensation or compromise, then it is called civil matter. And at this time, or in this court, the, the quality of evidence is a bit low. That is preponderance of probability. Just that, that, that what is being said, it, is, it has probability to happen. But on the other side, if a wrong is dealt by a court by punishment or fine or both, then it is a criminal matter. But here, the quality of evidence should be very high, beyond reasonable doubt. It is said that let 100 or 1,000 criminal be left as caught free, but not even a single innocent be sent to jail. So this is the hallmark, and that is why the, the quality is, must be very high in criminal cases. But these days, with the changing world, I think this classification of civil, what I have told, has changed its dimension, and now it is intermixed, even in criminal matters, sometimes compensation is being awarded, and so on and so forth. Legal perspective for DNA, as I mentioned, section 45 does not have any footprint, 293 does not have, but section 53A and 164A has in CRPC. 53A deals with medical examination as well as collection of DNA of accused and other section deal for uh, victim. The difference here is that for accused, you need not to get his consent or her, his consent. But in case of victim, whether it is a child or major, maybe male or female, if victim is there, then you have to take consent for both medical examination as well as for collection of DNA. And these are certain issues which need to be understood in more detail. Now it is precautionary part at the sample level. Contamination is important as, as Professor Mitra has elaborated. Loss, suppose if it is a very trace, uh, component trace uh, um, amount of sample found on uh, space uh, on the spot and if you do not know how to pick it up how to collect it then it may be lost degradation again it's a, a challenge manipulation and tampering this is very important and that is how the the, uh, the forensic fraud are uh, very important to understand as i mentioned in the beginning that we should believe that 
साइंस डू नॉट टॉक और डू नॉट डू रोंग बट मैन बिहाइंड साइंस कैन डू एनी रोंग एंड फोरेंसिक साइंस इज नॉट एन एक्सेप्शन एंड वी शुड नॉट थिंक दैट एनीथिंग इज गोस्पल ट्रूथ वी शुड ऑलवेज बी वेरी ओपन एंड वेरी कॉशियस when we talk about anything uh, whether it is dna or 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 whatever and i talk about this forensic fraud although there are a number of examples and i think no jurisdiction is left out where such type of event and incident has not happened including us uk and everywhere <coughs> but in india i gave you one example just below right state of delhi versus khursi this case is interesting where in 2018 the uh, the honorable high court of delhi was dealing the pokso cases and in one case interestingly all other evidence including medical legal any many more evidence were 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 crying saying that this is the criminal who has committed this crime but dna was not matching and same type of situation had happened before the same bench of high court in three another cases at this point of time court gets some doubt and they set the sample again for uh, investigation uh, for for in dna analysis and to the surprise and to shock also the report matched and then again another three cases which were earlier dealt they were also sent and the same uh, they they also made the same fate connecting the crime with the criminal so here you see dna or any forensic evidence are prone for such situation so one has to be very very cautious and very very determined that nobody can defool the criminal justice system these are the this is my last slide way forward professionalism and capacity building of course specialization is needed probably like in cbi we have specialized teams but in state police also we need and many more jurisdiction has the same issue forensic facility uh, many country may be having good facility but uh, developing country like india and many more country they need augmentation both quality wise and quantity wise and legal recognition of forensic evidence as i mentioned that many evidence like dna we are using since last 25 30 years but it does not have direct evidence uh, uh, footprint in section 45 and others now another point i want to mention that about the storage of sample Uh, for forty years or so, something like that. Here, let me tell you that suppose uh, we deliver justice today, but tomorrow some more technique may come. And Innocence Project is the glaring example by which DNA and other technology has been used to revisit the the injustice done in the name of justice. So that type of thing is possible, and we should learn from our past. That is always a good story. And with this, now I. i could complete my task in 55 uh, i think 50 minute follow me has given me this warning in the mail saying that you should conclude in 45 to 50 minute so i could keep my word i know something i have rushed out but uh, always time is a sense of life and we should stick to it thank you very much for giving me this opportunity thank you very much sir thank you dr goswami uh, you have covered a lot of content and we've got a varied uh, range of questions but we will stick to uh, certain questions that are pertaining to the purview of what this talk was about and um, i'll start with some questions um, which is that uh, let me just scroll up from this thing Uh, the views your views on the national security act and how it works with uh, regards to the custody of the accused and uh, and to what extent should the crime be booked under that law you see national security act is a very wide spectrum you know and uh, it may be used there are certain parameters that national security is the core uh, where uh, national security that the threat say for example money laundering or any kind of you know waging war against the state and many more such type of thing although we have all such type of uh, laws already in our ipc but for strengthening 
the legal discourse and legal regime we have designed and enacted the separate law and as far as the connectivity of forensic science with nsa cases is concerned nsa also desire the full proof evidencing and evidence quality so there also say say for example if we are talking about a terrorism a terrorist activity or a terrorist is being dealt then also we need important corroborative evidence and in forensic science we have a large number of you know uh, things about uh, terrorist activity it may be explosives and so many things so there is a clear cut connection of nsa and uh, quality of evidence and then per se with forensic science there's another question from nagendra kumar which is kind of on the grounds of what you were already saying which is that um a lot of lawyers and judges have uh, and sometimes even the police have a problem understanding the the nitty gritties of forensic evidence and collection procedures uh, since you were part of the cbi academy and part, and have participated in many training um modules would you let us know about how we are trying to bridge this gap between practice in practice and um the science community you see uh, this question is very pertinent and important question actually it is basically mindset let me tell you there are, this question has so many dimensions actually the first point is the the knowledge and understanding that means the capacity building many of our 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 investigating officers working on the down line on the ground they are not as well trained as they should be so that is first their challenge is their knowledge their understanding and and their knowledge pool so that is one point second point is that as i mentioned that we need to have a specialization of uh, investigation cases like cbi we have special crime that anti corruption economic offense banking and so forth and so forth see for example say now i am working in uttar pradesh we have more than 2 lakh police force and for our uh, foreign delegates sitting here one uh, 10 lakhs means 1 million right so such a huge force can we really think to train everybody in every discipline simply no so we have to develop the culture of specialization identify the crime in a particular district and then make team and then give them regular inputs of different kind that only we can think further we need to have forensic facility let me tell you very clearly that because of so many reasons the reports are pending since many months sometime even years so how can you conclude a investigation without getting a report and this is the reason why investigator at the ground level they avoid to go for collection of forensic evidence so there are interlinked issues and problems i think it needs a detailed discussion detailed you know uh, means approach how to deal with it it is not just to say something and it will be done it's a very you know vast area where where lot of money lot of will power and lot of efforts are to be made i i want to ask a follow up question on that also but let's take this one from uh, el sama ke anthony um where he cites a lot he or she they cite a lot of uh, cases called mehmood versus state of up malappa sidappa alakumar versus state of karnataka etc where apparently the uh, conviction cannot be granted on the basis of forensic report and they said that even if there is a conflict between medical and eyewitness testimony then the eyewitness evidence is prioritized over medical evidence this i know does happen but i am also aware and correct me uh, if i'm wrong but there is a section i think 46 or 47 of our indian evidence act which says that a fact that has previously not been considered important or whether it is in con- conflict with other information will become relevant if um if uh, the the forensic report uh, says that it is a relevant point of contention 
so between these two they seem two contradictory provisions about where uh, for, where forensic testimony is actually placed at a lower value than eyewitness testimony and the legislature dictates that forensic testimony be placed at a higher value than eyewitness testimony so from your understanding what is more prevalent in practice yeah this is again a very paradox let me tell you very clearly and uh, the reason again is multi dimensional as you rightly mention that our legal interpretation our judicial interpretation rather supreme court high court has multiple times have stressed and said that oral uh, testimony particularly eye witness has upper hand no doubt about it right and i have also seen uh, because i used to uh, co contribute one article in um, annual survey of indian law their forensic law is there which i i, i contribute there i have also seen in many cases that despite matching dna report in sexual offense particularly even then the the case has been exonerated okay acquittal have been made but the the important point here is that first there as i mentioned i give you one important example although i am not very convinced with that but it is recent judgment in 2019 i just came across i just give you anecdote you will understand in one case uh, the family member was the accused it was incest case and dna was matching okay the court took this plea and uh, uh, the other evidence were also although sometime in court judgments you do not get so many inputs what were the exact you know background and so many things so whatever limited knowledge you have from that judgment can or you can only decipher your you know argument or anything so what was there that the, the court said the lower court uh, convicted but in appeal in high court the court observed that look this girl was staying in the house the accused was also in the house so there was possibility of exchange of dna material okay and it was exonerated now the question arises how suppose if it is on cloth i can understand that is that may be possible but if it is in vaginal swab then i think it needs to be understood in that way so sometime even let me tell you very clearly i have no hesitation in saying that ignorance is there at every level how many people are aware that what is the 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 the, the matter data of any forensic input i tell you that very few persons knows that how any expert reached to this conclusion and if you open that layer then you really know that there are so many fishy things behind any expert opinion and court also i won't tell you many things on this record because it is online and air but judiciary they also have their limitations and in one uh, uh, seminar like you have conducted i was there around 2 3 months back there were around 8 10 i court judges but luckily they were all retired one and few of them i think many of them uh, admit on the screen itself saying that you see what you have told here we were not even knowing anything out of that and we have given so many judgments so i am not saying anything against pro or cons the point is that probably this area is least talked least addressed you see even in law school i i did my llm from indian law institute i fought a lot saying that why don't you introduce forensic science as subject criminal law subject now even even your 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 uh, this jdu they have introduced it as a, as a, as a optional subject and that is good that at least there is a beginning but it should be core subject and let me tell you one more thing unfortunately why this happened it happened because justice is being thought that it is only the baby of the court and that is why always we talk about fair trial but there is hardly any talk about fair investigation and without fair investigation whether where without proper evidence how can fair trial is possible so 
fair investigation is the quintessence of fair trial. Until unless we give proper stress, and there is now one case which is in pipeline, which uh, Supreme Court has taken up so motto on 18th December 2019. That case, I think, will turn that system around uh, completely. It has collected so many, asked to collect so many data on so many cases, uh, forensic science and other things. Those who have interest may go through that judgment. It is a wonderful possibility. I think everybody should contribute and find out some solution. Now I come to conclusion to your question. The issue is that when this evidence at what sections you have mentioned, at that time, all these forensic evidence were not there. It was 1872. And if you see those sections, there is hardly any amendment. So we are talking in old era, around say 150 years back. And now by the time, a lot of water has been flown in the river. So we have to think in the modern concept, but nevertheless, probably uh, if there is a good prosecutor, then uh, things can be done better. But because of lack of understanding of forensic science and forensic reports and their interpretation, uh, the, the, the injustice has been carried out. I have no hesitation in saying. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, this ties in, and this will be the last question that we'll be taking, although a lot of people have a lot of questions for you. Um, so maybe if you are open to sharing your email ID uh, publicly, they can ask, uh, they can connect with you personally. But this is something that Aishna had asked, which I'm going to paraphrase because some bits of it has been answered. But you are clearly highlighting, I mean, in this discussion, we are highlighting the inadequacies in training and um, accessibility of scientific knowledge in the, amongst the judiciary and uh, the, the, the lack of discussion or correlation between um, the three pillars that are involved, the judges, um, the law and the police, uh, along with the forensic scientist. So, but you are also aware that some of our colleagues like Dr. Bajpai and, and several others are now engaged as part of a committee that is reforming the CRPC um, and the IPC and the IEA, the Indian Evidence Act, the Criminal Procedural Code, and the Indian Penal Code. So what do you think that they should be um, doing with regards to bringing uh, the forensic discussion into the law, prioritizing at all levels? Yeah, follow me. <laughs> I am also part of that committee under uh, Professor Ranveer Singh Saab. Yes. Um, uh, basically, I am the advisor of that committee officially, and uh, I am the uh, honorary professor of that university also. So I am in very, you know, day-to-day -day affair what is happening in that. And particularly, we are considering, and uh, Professor Singh and uh, Professor Vajpayee, they are all convinced that we should have a separate, you know, section on forensic evidencing. We should improve the quality of evidence in black and white. You should not just left. Say, for example, I give one uh, argument. The, many people of my own fraternity does not agree to it. But I say this, that why don't we give opportunity to both victim as well as accused for instilling equitable justice that they can suggest that please collect this, this, this evidence. Okay. Now the question arises, People may say, and there is one judgment, interestingly, in 2019, recently, one fellow, one accused asked the court to permit or to direct the police that you please collect the CCTV footage where the incident happened. Right? This was the request made by the, the accused. Okay. This was turned down and turned down even by Honorable High Court, saying that, that you cannot steer the course of investigation. My take here is that he or she is not steering the, the, the course of investigation. He or she is only asking to collect evidence. And that evidence will go out and will be, will be out forever if you are not collecting in time. So my take is that if you are asked that what kind of evidence you want, and if it is not possible uh, to collect, then uh, uh, make it writing and send it to the court that this was the list of victims, this was the list of accused, but we could not collect this evidence because this, this is this region. And if court find, okay, then it's fine. But my say is 
that even accused i am neither favor favoring victim nor accused i am favoring only the justice system right the the just the accused does not have any say in evidence collection and not only accused even victim does not have any say why it should be a democratic system there should be part and parcel of of this process okay police should be given upper hand no doubt about it but there should be an open uh, you know where where otherwise you just see about the accused accused only get this opportunity at very later stage when 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 uh, at the stage of section 313 of crpc at the end then only he or she brings his defense why by the time there is no evidence how can he or she bring the forensic evidence so our system need complete you know reconsideration we should give the equitable justice it is not as if it is a colonial law i am not saying that colonial was bad or good but it needs reconsideration in the the modern world so that is how i want to convey to you that it needs a complete overhaul and a new chapter in our legal system on forensic science and evidence yes that is definitely true and i'm so glad that uh, you are there part of the advisory committee of course that's not public information so i didn't know that you were involved uh, but that is very important i feel like one of the things that this new reformative legislation has to do is emphasize on on the forensic fit uh, but then again the equality of arms in our country um, is very tricky because this adversarial system has its flaws and doing uh, facilitating investigation on both ends um are there are costs attached uh, and and other things there is the backlog of evidence analysis in the fsls already that we are dealing with so uh, surmounting all these um, challenges and and uh, uh, obstacles is going to be a very big uh up overhaul for uh for the indian uh, criminal justice system do you, do you agree <laughs> you are actually opening the pandora box i know okay <laughs> i i will give you the answer okay see we are running into 75 80 year of our independence now okay we have to think we have to begin from we cannot take these lame excuses and one more thing i tell you generally we have forensic laboratories okay and we always feel that they are overburdened this and that but do we really see any time that a machine or a man how much he or the machine should perform in a day or maybe in month so there must be an auditing of man and machine right i with certainty i can tell you that say for example dna nowadays in general machines they have either 24 vial system or 48 vial system Okay, minimum twenty-four, and one machine can produce at least with one examiner at least forty uh, reports per day. Forty. I am to talking lesser. I have talked with many examiners, with many experts. They say fifty. I am talking say take it twenty-five. So twenty-five a day. How many uh, it will be done, and how much they do? They do seventy in a year, hundred in a year. so the issue is not only just to wash our hands saying that this this is very cost effective this is that and this is that we have lot of money money i don't think is a challenge is a problem we have modernization fund and nirbhaya fund and even is one one high court has given direction in assam saying that why don't you use the i was i was advocating this since last couple of years that why don't you use this modernization fund for augmenting your forensic facility now even high court has given this direction to the district uh, to the chief secretary that use this for forensic so money is not the problem is our mindset and when there is a way there there is a wish there is a way so so you have to think that we have to do it and when you have that conviction you will do it i have this uh, you know uh, perfect vision in my mind that nobody can stop you if you have your priority so i think priority has to be changed that we want the scientific aid into our investigation and criminal justice system if th this is the attitude then you will find the way otherwise every time we will have such chat and talk and nothing will move on that's it
uh, thank you because that that's a kind of insight that we get as academics who are only reading about this and you know we read about oh, overburdening of the labs but since you are you come from uh, a place where you watch the labs work and you're more familiar with what is happening on the ground uh, this is the kind of insight for which we are gathered here to to bridge the gap between reality and academia uh, so uh, i think we have already overshot our time a lot and, and the zoom meeting is going to end very soon so unfortunately i will have to log off but hopefully we can take some of these questions to um, later on uh, with the other speakers as well uh, thank you so much dr goswami for your uh, talk and thank you dr sharafi and dr namika for staying with us uh, through the entire session i hope everyone enjoyed i understand that there has been some problems with regards to registration just to clarify uh, the attendance link that was sent which is a google form will suffice for both session 1 and 2 if you have filled in the previous form that's fine as well we will look into everything when we are collecting the data uh, my colleague has just shared the third form for the uh, goswami session um, that's also a google form please fill that in and uh, we'll be happy to uh, look at all of that if you have any issues please uh, write to my colleague akshaya uh, her email id is already present in the mail but i'm adding it yet again um please uh, if you have any issues with today's attendance form please write to her uh, thank you to all our speakers uh, for joining us thank you so much for taking uh, time from your very busy day dr goswami and thank you to all our audience for staying with us um and we we'll see, i'll see you guys tomorrow enjoy your evening thanks bye thank you